Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. Peace and love. Welcome back to the Travelers Podcast. I'm Brother Ali. Uh, if you listen to this thing all the time, or like if you've got it on shuffle or something and it's jumping around from episode to episode, it might almost sound like I have a pre-recorded intro because every single week that we have a guest, I'm saying, I'm so happy to have this guest. But really all of them, you know, we we don't have like somebody that books this show. Like this is me reaching out to people that I want to talk to. And in this case, this is somebody that I didn't know that actually reached out to me. It's DJ Kenny Parker, who is a world-renowned DJ and producer. Uh, he's done amazing things in music, but really the hip hop world knows him because of the fact that he is KRS-One's brother. Um, KRS-One, anybody that knows me knows that KRS-One is my all-time favorite MC in the world. Um, so much of who I am as a person is based on listening to his music and attending his lecture when I was 13 years old. If you haven't heard, go back to the first episode of this podcast. I talk about the fact that when I was young, I memorized everything that KRS said. And then at 13 years old, I attended a lecture when he had written a book and he brought me on stage and talked to me and told me to read Autobiography of Malcolm X, which led to me being a Muslim. And when I was standing on that stage with my favorite rapper giving a lecture about history, philosophy, spirituality, metaphysics, all this stuff, I just knew this is what I am. Like I'm looking at him and I got to be on the stage and see it from his vantage point. Even though I was 13 and five something and he's, you know, KRS one is maybe six three or something. But just I saw the world through that lens and it's like that's that moment where I just knew for certain. I always wanted to be an MC. I always wanted to be a speaker. I always wanted to be, you know, have a microphone. But standing there with KRS One, that's it. And they also made the first ever live hip hop album called Boogie Down Productions Live Hardcore Worldwide. And it's a collection of three different concerts. And that thing to me is the holy grail of performing. Like even now, all these years later, I'm still standing on stage every single night. That is the pinnacle that I'm trying to reach, is especially the first show on there. Some of it was captured on video, but go and listen to that album. It's on streaming services. I would suggest buying it if you can. I mean, if you've seen me perform, you know, especially in in my like you know formative years, it really all comes from that album, and so much of who I am, and and and. DJ Kenny Parker is DJing on that album. He's speaking, he's cutting the records, he's playing the beats. He's really the conductor for that, that performance. And so this is somebody who's lived in my heart and in my life, and he's part of my DNA. He's part of who I am as a person, as a man, as a musician, as a performer, as a dad, as a you know spiritual practitioner. Like he, This man is part of who I am. And a couple weeks ago, I get a DM on Instagram from DJ Kenny Parker. And he's introducing himself like I wouldn't know who he was. And he says, I have good news. I wrote a book called My Brother's Name is Kenny. Anybody that knows, the first time we heard about Kenny Parker was on the second Boogie Down Productions album, My Philosophy, one of my favorite songs of all time. All of my children can recite this song from memory. You know what I'm saying? And in it, in the song, he says, my brother's name is Kenny. That's Kenny Parker. My other brother, I see you is much darker. Boogie Down Productions is made up of teachers. The lecture is conducted from the mic into the speaker. Who gets weaker, the king or the teacher? It's not about a salary. It's all about reality. Teachers teach and do the world good. Kings just rule and most are never understood. If you were to rule or govern a certain industry, everyone in the room right now would be in misery. No one would get along nor sing a song because everyone be singing for the king. Am I wrong? Yeah, this this is one of the greatest things ever done. And he shouts out his brother in this record. And so Kenny Parker wrote a book about his own life, but by extension, it's about their life together as children, as brothers. Growing up in New York and when it was the murder capital and really outlining the life that and the childhood that they had together. And Please go and get this book and read it. If you care about hip hop culture, if you're interested in the history and the lived experience of the human beings that have given this tremendous, these these just 
treasures to the world and really shaped and formed so much of who we are, the best of who we are. This book is really important, but even if you're not into hip hop, I have people that listen to this podcast because we're both Muslim or because we're both you know, politically on a similar page. I'm telling you, this is an incredible story of these two lives. And they endured just heartbreaking, tremendous challenges. Talking about growing up in New York at the time and everything that comes along with it, but also just really horrific neglect and abuse at the hands of the people that were raising them. And to the point that really they seem like as children, they're all each other had, KRS and his brother. And you just learn so much about KRS's childhood that brings him into focus. These types of things are necessary. You know, I mentioned at the end of the conversation with, with Kenny that, you know, Jesus didn't write the gospel. It was written by his companions. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't write the hadith. They were written by his companions. But so much of what we need for great people, you know, Socrates is the one telling us about Plato. You know, Jay-Z is helping us understand and contextualize Biggie. You know, we know about Rumi and his great work because of the scribe that actually wrote it down, uh, Hassan Medina Chalabi. So like, it's, it's necessary for these great figures because they can't contextualize themselves and they can't tell their own stories from the vantage point of somebody who loves them and sees them and witnesses them and experiences them and is seeing their life as a linear story in, in a way that those great people can't see it themselves. So what Kenny does here is so extremely generous and is so extremely important. And I just had a blast talking to him. And so this is a conversation that I was really grateful to have. Big salute and shout out to Kenny Parker for reaching out to me. You know, that's a, that's a big validation for me, for, for somebody that I look up to and respect and love so much, uh, to reach out to me and say, yo, I want to be on the Travelers podcast. Specifically, this is the first time for me that somebody, a historical figure from the culture like this, saw the podcast and actually didn't say like, hey, I want, like, if you ever need a, if you ever need a beat, let me know. You know what I'm saying? Or if you ever need, you know, but was like, yo, your, 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 your platform of documenting and talking about the culture is one that this is the type of platform that I wrote this book to be able to, to share. So it just really means a lot. We're brought to you as always by Zakat Foundation. We also have a new sponsor that you heard it. If you checked out last week's episode, uh, Better Help is a sponsor of the podcast now, is a partner in the podcast now, uh, as well as Mystic Man, um, men's hair care products. Enjoy this episode of the Traveler's Podcast. Man, man, man. So I, I was so um, happy to get hit up from you. I mean, I've, I've been hearing your voice, man, from the time I was a teenager. That uh, oh, BDP dope. Live Hardcore Worldwide yeah, is yes. like the Bible to me. Oh, like I've dope. I've fed my children their entire life by performing, by doing hip hop shows. And the like what I always go back to, like if I want to get in shape, I've put that on to work out. You know what I mean? Like that record to me oh, is- Oh, that is so dope. Yeah, man. So your voice, you know, here we go, y'all. Like the whole just, you know what I mean? Like- <laughs> You're, Yo, you're, people you're, have sampled that. Here we go, y'all. I've heard that in songs. I'm like, can, I'm old enough to be sampled. Wait a minute, because you know, to me, sampling is you know James Brown old. So for some young dude to sample me, I'm like, oh man, I really, I, I must be up there. <laughs> nah, it's real. It's real. Yeah, I've sampled that. I've sampled. I actually sampled. I end up sampling Miss Melody a lot, man, from that record. Oh, oh her, her rest in peace. Because her voice is so crazy. Yeah, it was. Cuts right through. Man. I mean, it is so ill that like, you know, just her being Chris's wife and then the fact that like who really could match his voice as as his hype man? It right. seems like she's the greatest there's ever been. Willie D was great. You were great. But right, man, right. that right. say ho, ho. <laughs> like, my God, man. That's like incredible. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> just like you know it's funny about that we used to laugh because every time she came out and said nah man I ain't buying it everybody went crazy and, and it used to be like we don't even understand why that part and um, Chris told me that 
when he was writing the song, Miss Melody was like, write me into the song. Like, write mm. me a piece. So, like, she wanted to piece. So, Chris wrote, all these suckers claiming to rule the environment. Nah, man, I ain't buying it. Like, he just wrote that into the song because she was putting pressure on him. And it turned Dope. out to be a part that everybody loved. Dope. Crazy. That's so yeah, crazy. Yeah, man. Yeah. So ill. Yeah, my, my whole life is, so, you know, so Chris is my favorite MC of all time. Dope. And really my whole life, like I became the person I am. So I'm a, I'm a albino kid, born in Madison, Wisconsin, raised in Michigan and Minnesota. When right. I was 13 in 1990, Chris did that lecture tour for the, that ended up on the edutainment record. Right, like okay. The, and so he came to University of, uh, I was at Michigan State University. Uh, like just, I, I lived in East Lansing, Michigan. So mm. at 13 years old, I went to that lecture. I brought the book. Remember the book that, that him and Nelson George did for Stop the Violence? It yes. Like, it had the pictures of each one of the artists in it and they had yes. little write-ups and stuff. So I've, I've seen the cover. I've never saw the inside. Man, I had that thing memorized. I brought that thing to, to that lecture and I asked him to sign it. They had like question and answer at the end. So I was like, when all this is over, I know you got an event going on, but at, when you're done with all this, could you mm -hmm. sign it? And he was like, no, come on stage right now. So I'm 13 That's years old. He dope. brought me on stage. And he you asked must me, have been blown, mind blown. Dude, I was like, you know, I just think about like you in the booth with Red Alert DJing, like, yo, I can't, <laughs> like, I can't tell this guy, or like being his roommate, like, I can't tell this guy he's that how much I, you know. And right, um, right. so he signed it for me and he said, Unite Humanity, Karis One. And he was like, Have you read Malcolm the autobiography of Malcolm X? And I was like, No, I already knew I wanted to be an MC. But I right. read the autobiography, became a Muslim. I married a woman from the Bronx. Like, dope. my like my whole life is is can really say like that's it started so in that dope. moment, man. That's so that's so dope. So this was meant to be. This whole connection was meant to be. And so dope. when you hit me up, when you were like, you were so humble and like, peace. My name is Kenny Parker. I'm Karis One's brother. I'm a DJ, and I wrote this book. I was like, yo. <laughs> Like, no, man, was, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you don't know who I am. I'm trying to, you know, get my stuff out there. So, and I want people to read the story as well. So, yeah. you know, maybe you can, I can inspire some people. So. Absolutely, yeah. man. It, it's, you really put, you're so generous with your story, especially some of the details that I think a lot of, a lot of people would find it difficult to share with the world. Right, right. I, how do you feel like now that the book is out? Well, the, the, the response has been so overwhelmingly positive that, you know, it makes me feel good because, you know, I felt like I knew it was a great story. It's just, did I tell it right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, could, I could tell a, a good story wrong. So I'm mm -hmm. like, if I, told, if I tell this story right, I can inspire some people. And they, but I have, to, I have to be honest. I have to really tell everything. In order for you to see where we got to, you have to really see where we started. So, you know, I, I'm like, you know, I'm going to tell my truth, but, you know, I had to ask Chris for his permission to tell, you know, our, our real family story and tell a lot of his stuff that people don't know about him. You know, that when I was writing the book, that's the first thing I did was I, you know, I sat down with him and I was like, you know, I want to tell the whole story. You know, people mm -hmm. don't know the whole story and, you know, you have a, a very crafted image over 35 years. So I don't want to say something that, you know, would interfere with your image that people know, but I want to tell people everything. And, you know, his exact words were, I don't give a fuck. Tell <laughs> <laughs> That's his exact word. And he said, and don't forget this. And don't forget this. And don't forget this. And he just started saying like stuff. Don't forget when this happened, that happened. So I'm like, once he said that, I'm like, oh, it's on now. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to let it roll. I'm going to let my stuff roll. I'm going to let some of his stuff. I'm just going to let it roll. Yeah. So. Man, you know, it's crazy. Like his voice is so iconic and not only his rhyming voice, but his speaking voice. Yes. There's an episode of the of Quest Loves podcast where he's interviewing Chris Rock. And what you find out in this episode is that Jay-Z has a KRS impression. So like really? Jay -Z, yeah, so Jay Z appear will be talking to people and say, "Well, actually," and that's like his <laughs> exactly. But then exactly. you find out. So so Quest Love is sharing that with Chris Rock, but then Chris Rock lets it go that Eddie Murphy has a KRS impression. 
And and what he well, says I is, I haven't heard this. You no, know, yeah. And he says that 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 out of nowhere, like on a private jet, Eddie Murphy will just announce to the world, "My rhymes will destroy you." <laughs> With 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 uh, with the teacher's voice, man. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying, so just hearing you, hearing him say, "I don't give up." Like people, I don't right. think realize that he talks like that all of the time. All There's the time. not a time when he's right. not being the teacher all exactly. the time. All the yeah. time. It's and crazy, uh, what people, man. what a lot of people don't know about KRS is that he's really funny. Mm-hmm. Like to know him, like book. you know. Obviously, I know him as well, you know. But he has a real funny sense of humor. Like most people know him as you know, an MC or a scholar. But you know, he has a lot of jokes that he said. You know, he he has characters of caricatures of himself. I've seen KRS do a Mace impersonation that was hilarious. That I was ever seen. I've seen Chris do a Mace imper the rapper Mace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. impersonation. Of one of his videos, and we were on the floor crying, laughing. <laughs> so just stuff like that. So when you say Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Murphy's great with impersonation. So that must. Yeah, be dude. Like, man, I want to hear. I want to hear both the Jay Z one and, but, but really that Eddie Murphy joint, man. I gotta hear that joint. And the way I see Jay Z, I don't see him doing impersonations. So the way I see him, that would be hilarious because I don't see him as that. So right. to see him doing impersonation must be unbelievable. Next level. <laughs> Yeah. Man, you know, so I don't think it's possible for anybody because the, the the story is your story, but but you're yeah. so inextricably and inevitably tied to your brother, right. you know. So even naming it like my brother's name is Kenny, you know, like this is your story, but right. but but Chris is so tied up in it, obviously, yes. um, and it's such a service, man, that you've done for us all because, as you know, I mean, your brother is not only one of the greatest. Uh, cultural leaders and giants and heroes, one of the great and artistic heroes and giants, but then also Mm -hmm. just a community leader. Like for us growing up, looking up to y'all, it's like he was Malcolm X and Mark Twain and like, you know what I'm saying? And James Brown and like the, he's the greatest performer, I believe. I believe in terms of like, who is the one person that can stand on stage and perform better better than anybody? You know, the roots are ill. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people that are amazing. Busta Rhymes with Spliff Star is ill. But in terms of one person with a microphone rocking any situation he's in with a DJ he's never met or in a country that doesn't speak any English, English, There's nobody that can that can compare to him, and there's like such a myth about like a like a figure like that. It's so important that the people that know him actually share the sto- the things that you're sharing, and tell the story as well, so that we can get the context. Because I don't know right. if he can all even know, you know, if if right. he can really, uh, if anybody c- is capable of seeing themselves. So what you've done in terms of sharing. His story and your story together is just such a tremendous service for the the history and the preservation of of hip hop culture, of Black history, of American history, of you know the cultural ta- you know also just documenting what was going on in Harlem and the Bronx and Brooklyn during that time. It's yeah. a tremendous like this contribution that you've made. Is up there with the records that you that that you and your brother made and that BDP made. Wow! So, man, I just have to so say much. thank you, man, for your no, service. Thank you for that. I mean, that's a, a, a tremendous compliment. Um, you know, it's funny when I when I finished the book, I gave it to Chris to read everything, and you know, I had I only had two rules. I had three rules. I said one. I said you can't give any input your opinion. This is my <laughs> version of the story. So you can't okay. say, well, you know, this happened. Whatever you were thinking at the time, that's what you were thinking. I'm telling you what I saw. Mm. I said, if there's anything that you want me to take out that you feel might be too embarrassing or you don't want out, tell me I'll take it out, which he didn't. Mm. And I said, I want everything to be accurate as far as BDP is concerned, because I want people to be able to pick up the book and, on, and use it almost as a reference, you mm-hmm. know, for BDP. So if there's anything that I said that you that's not accurate, like how you met Scott and, you know, things like that, let me know and I'll fix it. But he said everything that, that I said he felt was accurate. So other than that, I just let it roll, man. I really appreciate that you are... that you enjoy well, it. And I think there's there's no way to read this book, man, without loving you, brother. 
without just like mm-hmm. your story and the things that you share and the things that you went through and just how, even though you're 10 years older than me, but like reading about this stuff for both of y'all as little kids, mm-hmm. man, it's like, you know, people cry for you. There's not, there's not a way to, mm-hmm. without, because there, there are some things in this book that are, you know, really deeply challenging and sad. And, and like you said, yeah. some of the things you share about Chris are like, I don't think, we, I would have never expected that Chris got bullied. Like you all are such big, towering people. <laughs> right. And like when we see KRS-One, the teacher, the blastmaster, you could not imagine anybody ever bullying this guy. You wouldn't imagine him, you know, uh, some of the some of the things that you all went through. Um, you know, just even you sharing that like he had a problem with in the bed until late and late. You know, certain things that right. you, you would never see. But these, it's important to humanize our heroes so that right. it makes it that much more real to us that that's something I can be. Right. To, to see that these people are human and that not only do they have the same challenges as everybody else, but their challenges are even as great as their accomplishments. And it makes the accomplishments that much more special. So right. I wonder for you, though, because you share so much and there's so much pain and abuse and neglect, um, and you seem to be so precise about how you describe it, but also so fair to the people that you're talking about. Like you describe a lot of really painful stuff with your beloved mother, mm-hmm. but you're not unfair to her and you're not disparaging her. Mm-hmm. Um, have you gone through therapy? I know you I know you have a degree in psychology. Like, mm-hmm. have you done therapy? I, no, I have not. Um, just my own inner therapy. You know, I just come, I've just come to terms with certain things. Mm. And, you know, once you come to terms with things, you get like an inner peace and mm. then you can talk about it. Writing this book was like therapy for me because mm. I had to go back to some of those times, some of the things I didn't think about in years. And, and in order to tell a story, I had to get the whole emotion of the time to really tell it. And, you know, that some of that was difficult, but it also helped me as well, you know. Yeah. So that were there times, though, that were like almost like re-traumatizing? Did you have memories of moments or, um, you know, sometimes cause like I, I write stories about my life and I write about right. traumatic moments and I might talk about them on a the podcast or things, but there's moments where I'm like in the middle of telling a story and I, I have to make myself remember like this really happened to me. Yeah. 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 You're right. And one of the things that really, really strikes me is where at the end of each one of these years, you give like these recaps of what of all of the things that happened to you mm-hmm. in each one of these years and it's just year after year of like just heartbreaking challenge man so i'm it's just it's really profound and amazing that you've been able to to spell it all out in this way um it's a really amazing thing uh you know when you're sometimes when you're going through it all of that stuff seemed normal to me mm. Yeah, at the time, mm-hmm. you know, all these hardships, it just seemed like that's what it is. As I got older and met other families, other kids, you know, went to college, met, oh, but then you start to realize, wow, my life is really not like other people's lives, mm-hmm. you know? And then you start, to, I tell people stories sometimes, like some of the stories in the book I've told bits and pieces to people over the years, and they're like shocked. And I'm like, well, this didn't happen to everybody. Like, you know, like, like, you almost got to say to yourself, like, Oh, really? That must really be abnormal. You know, like some things like being homeless. I know like, you know, everyone wasn't homeless. You know, and I found myself homeless at points in, in my life. That was traumatizing to write about because that was really traumatizing in my life. Mm-hmm. But, um, I got, I managed to get past it. So, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like talking about somebody else, not you. Right. Like it's almost like third person. Sometimes you got to put yourself like this thing happened to that kid Kenny, and this is what Kenny was thinking, not me, even <laughs> though it's me. Right. But that kid Kenny went through this, and that kid Kenny was feeling that, and like that, I can separate myself from it because if you actually get in it, it's you know, it could, it could, it could cause you to need the therapy. Excuse me. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, it, and I mean, and it can be re-traumatizing. And like a lot of times, like yeah. what's so dope about, so my wife is a therapist. So like, mm-hmm. not only did I marry somebody from, like I married a social worker from the Bronx. <laughs> like, <That's so laughs> like there's That's time, there's incredible. times where like, I, I, like I'm reading this book and I'm just talking to my wife, like, yo, like my wife is from Park Chester and she li- like her family is wow. from there. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So when you That's talk right about there. going and tr- yeah, when you talk about like getting off the train and like t- there's like a two year period where you don't know where your brother is and you're yeah. just walking around trying to like that story of you finding him, you know, just getting off at Parkchester and just walking this entire street, you know what I mean? And then, uh, you know, just just by this beautiful divine intervention, realizing yes. that his, his group home is right across the street, you know, yeah. it's it's an amazing thing. And... I wonder, you know, with the 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 things that your mother seemed to have gone through, mm-hmm. it almost feels like that. It almost feels like there's like sections in the book and of of you guys' life. The way that I read it almost felt like it was related to whatever was going on with her and men. Yeah. So there's like the Harlem years, right? With the first, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and I don't I don't want to reveal the things, you know, all the stuff that's in the book, mm-hmm. but you describe a life in Harlem that we definitely would never have thought. That that you all were living because you all were living really well in Harlem. Like, we were living really well. Good. We were like the Huxtables for a second. Oh. <laughs> and it all went wrong. Fish tanks and just cable TV and all that kind of stuff. We had, yeah, we had it all as a kid, and and you know, a, a, a nuclear family. You know, mother, father, brother. You know, the whole thing. We were living the perfect American dream, but it was yeah. an illusion. Yeah. And then it seems like the, I mean, there, there's got to be, you know, generational trauma at play there. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? All these things. And then, you know, you had the years of, uh, you know, the years living it. There was seem like there was also another time of when your mom first left your first stepfather. And mm-hmm. then, you know, that seemed like a, like a, like a refreshing time, you know, and then, um, and then the, the Jamaican man, I mean, that was, that joint that, was that really. Just, that that. That was a. Uh, he's still alive too, actually. <laughs> Believe it or mm. not. Um, mm. I don't keep tabs on him, but my sister gives me little. Th- you know, it, I spoke to my sister a little while ago. She gives me little bits and pieces, but um, yeah, that was really tough. And you know, that was tough to talk about. But I just felt like I had to let it all hang out. You know, I had to tell it all. So yeah, and yeah, I'm that saying tough. that level of detail and and. You know, you talk about things in such a physical way that's that the embodiment of being there. You know, you talk about the mm-hmm. the the sound of. I mean, forgive me for talking about things that just because you said no, these things no, in the no, book no, doesn't no, mean that they're no, mine no. to talk about. No, but talk I mean, about anything. Yes, the sound of an extension cord and like the the. You know what I mean? For somebody reading that, you can hear it. You can you're there. You know, right. and then um, the feeling of of um, you know when you guys' mom put you out of the house and. You said you're talking about sleeping on the train and like you've been able to feel dirt in your hair and just being that hungry. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder though, do you guys have any kind of sense of your family history prior to your mother? And like what were some of the things that led up to, you know, the state that she found herself in? Because people don't aren't just born like that. Like right. Most of the time there, there's there's, you know, generational trauma that that shows up in people. And so I wonder, like, do you have any sense of of what their lives were like? My mother didn't talk about her childhood almost at all. The only thing I know is that she was an orphan. Mm. So I guess she lived in an orphanage for a while and a family uh what do they call it? adopted her. Wow. And then um and then um that didn't go well apparently, but she never really talks about it. She never talked about it. So I, I just got, you know, bits and pieces that she would reveal, but that's all I know. She was an orphan. By the time she was like 16, she left that, left that family, um, got a job. And then by, by 18, she had my brother. Mm -hmm. So 19, no, 19, she had my brother 20. She had me. So, you know, it was a small window between leaving the, orf- leaving the foster family and having her own family, and then we were off. So I don't really know much about her. I, I don't know my father at all. And there's no, you know, so there's no prior, there's no grandmothers or cousins. It's just us. 
you know, so I had no reference, sadly. It would have helped for a better story, but, you know. Yeah, my mother was adopted too, and she had like a closed adoption, so she never knew like who her who her family was. Oh. And then I, I I know that she I could I know that it's like, especially towards the end of her life, she told me that that really left like a hole in her soul and like her sense of self, and like even her feeling of like bond and connection and like she's like I don't know who they were I don't know why all I know is that when I was a baby somebody didn't want me, and somebody wow. was okay just saying goodbye to their to their baby, and so I know that that's that really, unbelievable like, impacted yeah. her yeah. I mean, I, I looked at it more like I'm here now. You know, whoever didn't want me or wanted me or whatever the story was, I'm here. I'm in yeah. the building. So, right. you know, so, you know, I'm here. <laughs> we're, you know, we're in the house. But... Right, we're in the house. I don't know yeah. how I got in here, who, who was on the guest list, but I'm in the party now. So, yeah. you know, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have a blast. That's how I try to look at it. Because if you look at it like, you know, so-and-so didn't want you, you know, it makes you feel like you're nothing. Mm-hmm. But I'm something. That's you know, right. I'm here. I'm I'm something. Whatever it is, I'm gonna be it. So and just the, I mean, in the act of writing that story, uh, the act of writing your life story really affirms that. You know, what I mean, the same way that the way people. It's so like so much about hip hop that I love is like the fact that you know, for for artists and for you know, especially the 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 music that made us love hip hop so mm-hmm. much. It's mm-hmm. like, yo, I'm. Who, like I'm Dougie Fresh, I can make noise with my mouth, and the whole mm-hmm. world should know about how great I am, like how <laughs> right. smart I am. How it doesn't matter. I'm poor. It doesn't matter that the whole world says it, that that I'm nothing. My country seems to think that I'm not worthy of any recognition at all. Right. But these sounds I make with my mouth mean that I am important, and the whole world should know who I am. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and there's something so so amazing about, you know, telling a story. And and like really, I don't know anybody that grew up in the hood who shouldn't write a book about their life. Like every single story is incredible. It is. It really is. And you know, that's the amazing thing about hip hop, which is different from I think any other music, is how you can express yourself and you can tell your story. You can tell other people's stories. You can tell what you saw. You can become a superhero. You know, Mm -hmm. you could be, you know, hiding under your covers in real life, but in your rhymes, you could be the Incredible Hulk if you want to be. You know, it's just the the potential is limitless. And, you know, I'm I'm such a hip hop fan. You know, as I write in a book, I'm I'm, I'm a junkie. I'm I'm amazed, you know, that I even get to talk to people. You know, the other day, for example, Cool Mo D um, left me a message on my phone. Happy birthday. And I'm like. I still can't believe it. Like, that's Cool Mo D from The Treacherous Three. Like, me and my brother used to sit there and listen to The Treacherous Three. And, like, I, I can call him my friend. You know what I mean? Like, I'm amazed by that. Still. You know, I've yeah. known Cool Mo D since the 80s. And I'm still like, yo, that's, that's Cool Mo D. Just called me. Like, yo. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you hear, the, you hear that voice sometimes. And you're just like. Oh, wait, you're talking to me? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's exactly how I feel about everybody. Even being here right now, to me, is amazing that, you know, you've allowed me on your platform and, you know, I get to speak and, and you actually read my book. I, I'm, I'm grateful. You know what I mean? You don't know if you're going to write something, if anybody's going to read it, you know? And if you, could, if you can get one person to read it and enjoy it, to me, that's a blessing. I mean, I, I hung on every word and I'll treasure it. And it, it will be, you know, the, it, it oftentimes takes takes generations before people realize the the significance. And I think everybody knows KRS significance, you mm-hmm. know, but I, but this this work that you've done is a really, really important volume. It's right there with Jamal Shabazz's photos and it's right there with, you know, the the archives of Yo! MTV Raps and it's right there oh, with all you. of this 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 work that's been done about hip hop and and all, and really man in a lot of ways it's a lot better i prefer uh works like this to what a lot of the academics have done even though that can be important too right. but it's a really it's a really humanizing thing you know we talk about like so much of the struggle in you guys lives growing up was related to your beloved mother um and 
when I look at both of you, at least from the outside, so I see that for as you know, really young KRS marries Miss Melody, and mm-hmm. she has a she's like a very strong like vocal presence mm-hmm. in his life. May she rest in peace. And mm-hmm. then KRS introduced us to Heather B, who's my homie, mm-hmm. you know, and and Heather yeah. B is strong. You yes. know what I mean? Loud, strong, powerful. Yes. To this day, she's like one of the most important voices in the culture. Mm-hmm. I know at one time, uh, Chris's wife was his manager. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know if that's if that's still the situation, still, yes, but, but Simone was Shout was out like, Simone. Shout out Simone, yes. Yeah, I mean, very powerful, very like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, protective of his space and his time mm-hmm. and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you talk about even being young and being in college and going on tour and you're like on the dope jam tour with all of these these women and people want autographs because your name's in the record and like mm-hmm. you know all of this stuff but you're like no i'm going to be loyal to my girlfriend back at home even yes. though there's no cell phones there's no picture phone there's, there's nothing no, but just like i have to be a person of integrity to this woman i love you talk about her giving you life advice and how to be a student and all this mm-hmm. stuff so you are has so much struggle with your mother and, and and still have such tremendous respect for and reverence and love for women at a time when that wasn't the norm at, in, in that time in hip hop it was totally acceptable right. to just be wild and crazy and so i wonder were there were there women in your were there other women in your lives or like where does this really deep like it's not just that it's there it's a it's an expressed commitment to loving, admiring, respecting, including women, having their voices be part of the platform. You know what I'm saying? Women of different mm-hmm. body shapes. Like now we have this body positivity thing. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But the fact that like there, there's women that look different, you know, different body shapes and sizes mm-hmm. and types and, mm-hmm. and different. There's light-skinned sisters and dark-skinned women. And mm-hmm. like, where does this, where does this come from? Like, how does how does this become such a real part of, of you and Chris and the way that you that you move? Well, I have to, I have to credit my mother. Mm. Um, you know, she gave us a lot of life lessons too. I mean, I don't know how much I express that in the book, but she gave us an appreciation of how we should treat women. And she always used to lecture us about women should be treated like this and you should never put your hands on a woman and you should always respect women. And she, you know, instilled that in us from an early age. So, you know, my mother gave us a lot of life lessons and built a foundation that we needed <laughs> as it turned out. She's the one that built the foundation, but she also shook the foundation. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a funny, it's like a funny dichotomy, but um, yes, our respect for women. I, I mean, I'm going to speak for myself. I'm sure Chris would say the same, but I'm going to speak for myself and say my mother's uh, has a tremendous influence on how I see women and how I think, I think they should be respected. And you also both have such a commitment to education. You know what I mean? Like yours was through the school system and then on right. to college. Right. And you talk about like Chris not having any, just like no time for school, but just spent hours in a library. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like studying philo- studying what he wanted to study, philosophy right. and, and religion and spirituality right. and metaphysics and all of this stuff. Um, and when we hear you must learn and he's saying... C spot run, run, get insulting to a black mentality, a black right. way of life. Or just, right. Like we've got to have, we need the 89 school system. And then, you know, reading the way that she spoke to you about the fact that you should absolutely learn, you should be empowered and what you mm-hmm. choose to learn should be self-referencing. It should be about, you know, black power, Afrocentric, mm-hmm. black stories, you know. Mm-hmm. And so you do see a lot of that. You do see a lot of that stuff show up. What was... uh you know, can you talk about just how the 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 what she instilled in y'all about learning? Because well, now he's for, the teacher. I'm saying like right. he's the educator of us all. Like she <laughs> yes. taught the educator of our whole generation. Yes. Believe and it you, or not, like you could not get on the mic if you were dumb because of that man. man. Like Ice T yeah. had to be smart. The Ghetto Boys had to be smart. Kid and Play had to be smart. <laughs> right. You had to be smart because of that man. Incredibly, um. Well, my mother instilled, first of all, instills of us, first of all, that in order to make and this is this is in the 60s, 70s. So she's coming from the heels of the Jim Crow era. So she's teaching us that in order to be black in America, you have to have an education if you're going to do anything in life. You know, my mother made me vow to her when I was a little kid. She said, I never want to see you sitting on top of a garbage can. 
that was her biggest pet peeve, that guys just hanging out on the corner, sitting on top of garbage cans. She always used to say, I don't care if you, you broke your leg, you got hit by a car. I do not <laughs> want to see you sitting on top of a garbage can. That's what they used to do back in the 70s. Guys used to just sit and use garbage cans as makeshift chairs. And she always was on top of us about education, education, education. And, you know, my brother rebelled against formal education, but he was about education as well. And I talk, you know, I try to speak a lot in the book about how a person that's not necessarily scholastically excel scholastically can be an intelligent person but you know the teachers will have you pegged as learning disabled he was really considered learning disabled as we were growing up but he really wasn't mm -hmm. he just was interested in what he wanted to learn and and he was very headstrong in that but it was once again my mother was education you'll never be anything she wouldn't let us speak slang in the house mm. you know i mentioned that if you know if i came in and i said hey ma what's up she would go, hey, Ma, what's up? Go outside, come back in the house, and address me properly. And I'd have to go outside, close the door, come back in the house. You know, hello, mother, how you doing? You know, how you? And then she'd be like, oh, you know, today went well. And she would make sure, like, you know, she would say, you can't speak slang. You'll never be anything in America if you talk like that. You mm -hmm. have to know how to be able to speak to people in order to be something in America. And we had this beat in our head from, like, four years old on. You have to have learned something. You cannot just not learn anything. Don't sit on the top of a garbage can out in the corner, you know. And so it was her that that instilled that education in us. And and to this day, really. Man, there's an author uh, by the name of Kiese Lehman, and he wrote a book called Heavy. And if he was he's he was just on the show not that long ago. He's a huge hip hop head. Um, but this book called Heavy is really, it's like a memoir. It's a letter to his mother. And it's a, but he's from Mississippi. He grew up, mm -hmm. he's like um, like the, the little brother generation of like David Banner and those guys mm -hmm. that came up in Mississippi. And this mm -hmm. whole thing is a love letter about him and his mother. And basically what he talks about is, he calls it a loving look at destructive love. That like, that like so many wow. times our families, our mothers are doing their best to love us. And a lot of the time their love is building us and a lot of time their love is messing us up and, and breaking us at the same time. Absolutely, that's truth. And she's a, she's a, a, a professor, you know what I mean? That, that like really instilled in him reading and writing and studying mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that, man. And maybe uh, after we get done, we get a, we get an address for you. I'll send you a copy of it, man. Absolutely. That, that seems to capture that that little piece seems to capture my my whole relationship with my mother, actually. Yeah, <laughs> On to I, a T, yeah. I just kept thinking about the the entire time that I was reading your book, I just kept thinking about 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 KSA in heaven or heavy. Yeah. So yeah, man, definitely want to want to want to connect you all as please, well. And I please. mean, and and he's such a hip hop fanatic. I'm sure that he shares the same sentiments that I do. You know, what I mean, I was sharing about being able to connect with you. Dope. So I'm I'm hearing like so many of the songs. Like as I was reading, so many of the things that I heard in the in in BDP lyrics and KRS lyrics started to make sense and started to come together. So one of the joints that everybody loves is "Love's Gonna Get You." Mm -hmm where he details what it's like to be poor and what it's like to just be in poverty. You right. Know? So he's talking about, I got three pairs of pants with my brother. My I brother. Share. That's true. Yeah. And I don't think that I necessarily, as a 13-year-old, 14-year-old hearing that, realized like, oh, this is from his experience. Mm -hmm. But in that song, he's also identifying with, sympathizing with, empathizing with, and giving context to what's going on with kids that are selling drugs. Right. So like, this is not just a monster. This is the time when Hillary Clinton is calling kids super predators. Right. And they got all these crazy laws that like, we got to lock these people. And the Democrats were talking like that. Mm -hmm. And so KRS is giving the backstory. Like, this is how we're living. You know what I mean? This is how people are living and the, and the decisions that people are being forced to make and even where, uh, how, how the violence happens. And it's just such a, it's such an anthropological, sociological, you know, expression from somebody that, that, you know, didn't do anything in school. It's that, like- Exactly. Amazing. You know, it, that story, when I first heard the song, um, 
I just laugh because a lot, a lot of what he described, you know, it's it's a it's a story. So some of it, you know, like he didn't sell drugs and get in a shootout with police, like you know. But the part about the poverty is is so on point. And you know, it's funny. He says, "I'm in junior high with a B plus grade." That's actually my story. That's you, more, right, 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 more than him. But um. And also he mixes and matches, you know, different parts. But that's absolutely. If you listen to a song called Out of Here, too. Yeah. One of Kara Swan's big songs. He talks a lot. And a lot of the things he says in that song actually happened. And I, that's like uh, from experience, those kind of things. Yeah. But Love's Gonna Get You, that was one of the one of the great songs. Yes. You know, it's deep that in that in that he's basically describing like the the very like real life decisions that people have to make. Yes. Like, am I going to be hungry? Is my little sister going to be hungry? Uh, is my mother going to have what she needs? Or am I am I going to you know? And also like living in a world that doesn't care about me, that doesn't care right. about my environment, that doesn't right. that has nothing for me. So like, what is l- illegal and legal? Right. In, and, in this and- kind of. Mm, and how easy it is to meet a guy like Rob and get caught up in the game. Right. It's that, see, you're just outside, you're hungry, and there goes a guy named Rob chilling in a Benz. And you're like, man, that's everything I need. And he's like, well, just come on. Right. It's, you know, it's great over here. And just like that, a guy who might have had a future doing something else slides in with a drug dealer named Rob, and the, his whole life takes a left turn. You know, it's it's that simple in the hood to happen. But it's so amazing that he's able to tell that story on behalf of so many people, you know, mm-hmm. and and you tell those stories of people that you were in the group home with that that mm-hmm. were killed. I mean, the amount of times you have to say rest in peace in this book, and you're only 50 some years. I mean, you know what I'm saying? The amount of times it's like rest in yeah. peace, peace, rest in yeah. peace. Rest in peace. People from life and people from, you know, the stage and 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 right. is amazing, man. But, it really is. You know, you and you and him never made that particular decision, though. Like, like the, Surprisingly, like the ability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what was the, you know, and I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, Kendrick Lamar talks about Good Kid, Mad City. Like, that, right. a lot of what, of what you describe in this book, like, is like the East Coast version of what Kendrick describes. And so right. many of our heroes are like, man, I just want to be a nice guy and go to school. And I, like, I live in this crazy place. You, you know, that's one of the themes I wanted, you know, I wanted to try to get across in my book is that contrary to popular belief, the majority of kids in the hood are regular mm-hmm. kids. Mm-hmm. They play ball. They go swimming. They, you know, want to watch TV and play games. They don't want to bust guns and rob people and be in gangs. Most kids want to do other things. It's just not a lot of opportunity. And also, I believe in the 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm. I think 20% of the people do 80% of the crime. And I talk in my book about how, like, a couple of guys, a handful of guys terrorized my whole junior high school. Right, Like, six or seven guys terrorized like a hundred students you know a small handful of people do most of the dirt in the hood most kids in the hood are regular kids and if you gave them a chance to do something else they would choose it a lot of times it's nothing else to do and a guy named rob walks up on you be like hey why don't you come over here and do this and you're like well uh, there's nothing else i might as well go over here and that's just like that your life changes From the very first episode of the Travelers Podcast, we've been sponsored by, we've been in partnership with, we've been supported by, we've been in community with Zakat Foundation, and I'm extremely grateful and honored to say that that's the case. Zakat, Z-A-K-A-T, deals with the, it's the pillar of Islam that requires us to give and gives us opportunities to give back and to share what we have. The idea of Zakat means to purify, so 
ideally we want all of our income to be from sources that are that we feel good about and that are lawful for the muslims in the prophetic code so a lot of people don't know that not only is it forbidden for us to partake in certain things it's also forbidden for us to sell things that are destructive um so i mean like it is not always the case i'm saying like all of the muslims are out here with this beautiful religion trying to figure it out and trying to live it and we've we're dealing with all sorts of contradictions and, and limitations and things like that. And so, you know, not only is it against our religion to drink alcohol, it's also against our religion to sell it and to profit from it. And it's one of the things that I need to really sift through when we do our tours and festivals and things like that, because, you know, it's tricky because they sell uh, alcohol at our shows. And this is not a judgment on people that drink alcohol. In in my faith tradition, it's that's unlawful and what is said about it in the Quran is that there's some good in it, but the harm far outweighs the good. And so, and then in, a, in another part of the Quran, it says that we're to stay away from it completely. And also, so not only are we not supposed to drink it, but we're not supposed to sell it and we're not supposed to profit from it. So, you know, I have to be really clear about the fact that like the tickets that are sold for this event, for people that are paying me to perform for them, I can get a portion of that, but I can't get a portion of the, the bar. That can't be part of my payment. And then there's a whole other thing that I deal with where, you know, if you're going to perform on the big festivals, a lot of them are sponsored by alcohol companies. And so, like, what do I do about that? So it's it's a tricky thing that I'm always having to navigate. All that to say that as Muslims, we always want our, the, our income to be uh, virtuous. Like we want to feel good about it. We want it to be allowed and, and, and good in our faith tradition and society, all that stuff. And the same is true with this podcast, you know. Um, but the fact is that the nature of the world, the nature of business, the nature of money is that it's really difficult to, in, to ensure that every dollar that comes in and that I spend isn't attached to some sort of degradation or suffering or, you know, something illegal or something immoral. It's, it's almost impossible to do that. And so part of how we purify our provisions is by giving back and by sharing. That's what zakat means. So every week we talk about zakat foundation. I just wanted to break that down a little bit. Zakat foundation is a global humanitarian organization that's set up so that Muslims have the, and, and also for non-Muslims, you don't have to be Muslim to give to them. And that's part of why I love advertising and talking about them because they just do dope things all over the world. And they don't only help Muslims uh, this isn't a, like a front to proselytize and to try to, you know, pressure people to become Muslim. It just really is like that we really welcome the opportunity to help wherever human beings are, are living. And then Zakat Foundation goes above and beyond to partner with people in the areas where they're giving to make sure that those people are in, in leadership roles about the work that's done. They have people on the ground ensuring that there's quality control, um, you know, a lot of the programs, like their orphan relief, orphan relief program, um, you know, you donate $50 a month to supporting an orphan and, and their family, and 100% of that goes directly to the people. Like, none of that $50 goes to uh, fund to um, salaries and advertising and marketing and overhead and all that stuff. 100% of that orphan relief stuff goes directly to the orphan. So there's just stuff that they do that's really dope. And one of the dope things that they do is understand the importance and the need for culture and how important and necessary it is, the imperative relationship between virtue and culture and art. And so they sponsored a podcast. So head to Zakat Foundation, uh, follow them on social media, it's Zakat US on uh, Facebook. I think it's Zakat Foundation of America. You can go to their website. Check out the stuff they do and consider giving something. Like put something, just contribute to the dope work that they're doing because these are people that I know and they're people that I trust and they're people that I work with. And if I have concerns, I can actually speak directly to them. So we're very grateful and honored to be in partnership, in community with and sponsored by Zakat Foundation. From the very beginning of my career, it's been all about being independent. And that's the case because we love this culture. We love the expression. 
We love our, our spiritual tradition. We love our communities. We love our, our ability to tell the truth as we're inspired by KRS-One. And we're really very just so grateful to have DJ Kenny Parker on here giving us some insight into the life that they lived. And it's important to be able to do that, man, to really be able to spread all the way out and not have to worry about if the people that pay the bills are going to be threatened by what we're saying, because most likely they are. And the fact that they pay the bills makes it so that they start making the decisions. We don't want to live like that. We don't want our art to be constricted like that. So what that requires is that we have a direct connection with you because y'all are the ones that really support us. So I say all that to say that social media is fine. Uh, you know, all that stuff is great. But we don't want to have to rely on them. You know, in order for everybody to see our posts, we got to pay them hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars. Like for all the people, for every single one of y'all that went to IG and Brother Ali is Blind or went to Twitter, Brother Ali, or Facebook, Brother Ali, or any of the platforms and follow me. I can post all day and you're not going to see it unless I give those companies, those corporations, hundreds and thousands of dollars. I've never posted a single thing that every single one of the people who said, yeah, show me Brother Ali content. I've never posted a single thing that everybody saw. It's never happened. So we have to stay in control of our communication. So go to brotherali.com. That's the website. That's our website. That's the official place to get our merch, to get news about all the shows that we're doing. There's ticket links there to all the events that we do. Um, also, you can see that there's write-ups, there's little like a little bit of contextual blurbs about all of the releases. You can go there and see like, what is this series of self-produced tour songs that I've done? Um, I did one with Evidence, did one with Fashion, did one with Bamboo and Mally and Toki Wright. And you can just see like the history of all of those joints. You can see what do I have to say about uh, my demo tape, Rites of Passage. You can see what I have to say about all these different joints. Um, you know, me and the team like put those all together and they don't live anywhere else. You can also go to the mailing list and you get emails directly written by me, not all the time, but just when we have something that we want to make sure that you see. And we've got these limited drops. Like I'm no longer in the business of trying to sell uh, one thing to everybody in creation. Like I, I know that there's a certain group of people that are rocking with me and present and paying attention in this moment. And I just really want to honor that. So we have a lot of things that we put out that are limited and exclusive and they sell out quickly. Whether it's like limited one-time vinyl of like these special home recordings I did, Brother Minister. We've got another joint coming soon. You know, um, we just did commemorative merch for... Welcome to the United Snakes, Land of the Thief, Home of the Slaves, you know what I'm saying, that I, I helped to design myself. And we made a whole line of merch around that stuff to help people celebrate it. Also, if you go to this section called Join, there's what we call a caravan where you can subscribe and you can, there's different levels and different ways to engage. You know, people get uh, different levels and layers of access. One of them, the highest level there, gets access to a Slack channel where... I mean, we're in there like really sharing our perspectives and experiences on life. And the people that are in there are people that would not know each other. They're from very, very different walks of life. And I'm very honored to just kind of facilitate that group. But that group has is becoming a family and a community of its own. Shout out to all my Slack, my Slack folks. You know, we have very like really, really intimate, deep conversations in there. So head to brotherali.com, sign the mailing list, check out the join section, check out the caravan, check out the merchandise, make sure that you are up on all of the events and the shows that we're doing. And we're very, very grateful for your support. You know, one of the things you were saying about your own story is like you tell your story so much, or even if you don't tell them that much, but like mm -hmm. the stories are so crazy that you start thinking of them as like a movie. Like you were saying, like right. this kid named Kenny did so and so, right. and you know, so so it's good to go back and revisit them and realize how just how right. real they are. I right. mean, you know, Karis has been so in instrumental in 
codifying the story of the origins of hip hop. Like the yes. like that yeah. story has a very specific narrative again because of right. that man. And so yes. much of what he's insisted on us knowing is like these things happened because in New York City in the 70s the music programs for kids were cut. The after school programs for kids were cut. Yes. And what you describe is the fact that between sports and really it seems like man one of the things that i didn't know is like when you describe like what those group homes meant to y to young guys that really needed that at that time even though there's challenges yeah. and things like that right. but, you know they're not they're not perfect right. but it really seems like between sports and those group homes like both of y'all were able to actually make that transition from kids that would have been sleeping on the train feeling the dirt in the hair and 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 probably ending up whatever to really being able to survive and I think it's really important when we when we think about the reality of like these programs, whether they're government or otherwise, for kids. Can you can you can you talk a little bit about the reality of sports and those group homes, man, and and the impact they made on your life? Well, as far as the group home, let let me shout out all the social workers around the world who really care about kids and who really take the time out. You know, they say, you know, if I could just save one kid, then I did my job. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to raise my hand. I'm one of those kids that was absolutely saved by counselors in a group home, as was my brother, but I'm going to speak for myself, um, that was saved because without these programs, a person like me, I really don't know what would have happened if there wasn't a group home program in New York City for kids like myself. I really don't know what would have happened in my life. Um, as far as sports, it's another outlet and it's something to do other than negativity. You know, a lot of kids who, who play football, baseball, basketball, boxing, whatever these programs are, those same kids could be in a gang mm -hmm. if, 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 if you didn't give them something else to do. And they would rather play football or baseball or, or, or be on the swim team. But if that wasn't available, a lot of these kids would turn to a life of crime. But luckily for me, I found sports at an early age and, 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 and I had some success in it. And it helped me get out of a very tough situation. Um, growing up in New York City in the early 80s, sports helped, got me out of there, basically. Sports and the group home really saved my life. Yeah. Amazing. You know, there, there's a couple moments where you mentioned like that, you know, so many people get up and do that job every day and they don't always get thanked. And so no. there's one moment where you say like, you know, that you wish that you had really gone back and given a proper yeah. goodbye yeah. to the people. And I know how real that is, man. You know, like I, there was a couple mm -hmm. years where, so I did, I, it's crazy because, you know, I identify with Chris so much, even though I don't know him very well. I've met him mm -hmm. two, three times in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wish I was close to him. I'm not, I, I'm not going to push my, you don't, you don't decide something like that. He decides. <laughs> I don't right, decide right, whether right. or not we're close. He decides whether <laughs> right, or not we're right, close. And he right. hasn't decided that yet. So I'm like, okay, you've given <laughs> us so much, day, sir. Yes. I'm just here for whatever. We've opened the door now. You have a little portal with me. We're going to try to make it happen. I, and see, I don't use my mutual friendships either. So now like uh, me, me and you is me and you. You know right. what I'm saying? Okay. And, 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 uh, yeah. Um, but man, so many things that I just, you know, haven't come. My birthday. So, you know, I'm born July 30th. Chuck D is a dear friend of mine. And so, shout Chuck out is, to it, the great, the great it, Chuck D. Yeah, man. You know, and, and so, you know, Chuck is born just a couple of days after us. And I think Chris is born just a couple of days after us. So every mm -hmm. time I'm like, yo, happy birthday. He's like, yeah, me and you and Chris, man, the Leos, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, man, all three of us are like such Leos, like straight out of the like book <laughs> of like Leo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but man. Chris is know, classic then, Leo. Oh my God! It really like it's just all on him, man. Like there's nothing good. Like it should be a picture of KRS-One. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, yeah. When you see a Leo, but there's so much about us, man. You know, I I also left home early just because I would rather be I would rather be you know cold and hungry and doing things my way, right? Than than, than being you know fed to whatever degree and taken care of to whatever degree and mm -hmm. have to do things my parents' way. I would rather right. be hungry. And right. to do it to do it my way, you know. Right. 
Um, but another one of the things is that, like I said, he introduced me to Islam by pointing me towards Malcolm X. And then I changed my name. I became Muslim, changed my name to Ali. And everybody in my life, like there's a very marked point where b- before that my name was Jason. And then when I became Ali, it's a different, you, you're, through the whole story of you guys growing up are talking about your brother. I don't even feel like I have the right to say this name, but like you're talking about my brother, Larry. Right. And then there's a point where you re-meet him after being separated for a couple years and you even stop referring, even in the book, like there's no more Larry. Right. Like it's Chris now. Right. What was it like to worry about him as much as you obviously did growing up and then to see him again after those couple years and he's living his dream? The emotions go from incredibly worried, relieved, shocked. I can't believe it. You know, like, how can I describe this? I mean, looking at him growing up, the trajectory that he was on, to see what he becomes is so shocking. That's why I wanted to really let people see really where we both were at, but where he was at, saying he wanted to be an MC, which was absurd in itself. You, you know, said it, he, would be, it would make more sense to say you're going to be an astronaut because yes. there literally were more astronauts in 1980, <laughs> in 1979 than there were rappers with, on records. The, absolutely. He, but he said, said he, 19- knew it that, he knew it that young. I, that's <clears throat> what I'm going to be. <laughs> he never wanted to be anything else. Like when he says, I am hip hop, he absolutely never wanted to be anything else in life except an MC. There's nothing else he wanted to be. And, you know, there was a time in my life where I, I didn't see him. He was going, I didn't know where he was. And, and I, like I, I, I mentioned, but I thought he was dead. Mm. And, and, and I was like, you know, my brother's gone. You know, this is mm. in the 80s. With all the things going on and crack had just took off, the crack era had just began and I was like, my brother's dead. And then he reappears as Chris with a record that Red Alert's going to play. Like, I, you know, I don't want to give it away, but I can't even, you know, I almost don't have words to describe to see somebody and I'm watching this unfold and I can't believe that this guy went to this and then he's challenging MC Shan, a dope MC at this point. It's shocking. You know, I went for, you know, relieve he's alive. Okay. He's alive. You're doing what? You know what I mean? Like, like, all the, you get all the emotions going back and forth. And and I, I, I try to, purvey it in a book you know i hope i i hope i did a good job but of the emotions that you have to feel going through this and i'm still shocked tell you the truth i still can't believe it after all these years you know i was i was actually talking to chris a little while ago and i I was still saying you know i really i cannot believe all that you've done it's it's unbelievable i mean he's lectured in over 500 universities Mm -hmm. I was there when he came home with his report cards. I, I, don't, you know, I don't even want to say, I mean, this guy, that guy lectured at Harvard. People paid money. Cornell in West Harvard. set that up. Yeah. Cornell West. Shout is the, to Cornell West. Yeah. He was the first guest on his podcast, one of my like mentors. So, so, and I always, I always remind him that like of our connection because that lecture tour that he's the first one, I think, to invite KRS to like, you need to be speaking in the halls of Harvard, not just any old spot, but like Harvard needs a KRS one lecture. And this is, that's 1989, 1990. He's a few years removed from being a, a high school dropout. He's he's years from a few years from that. He's speaking at Harvard. To me, it's unbelievable to see. You have to believe there's more to this life than just us. When you see certain things that's happened, you know, there has to be a divine presence 
because some of the things that happened in my life and in his life, I would consider almost miracles. And um, all I can say is it's unbelievable. For me, it's unbelievable. And just all the lives that you, that you both have touched, the, really the trajectory of the culture, if you think about you know, what you, you talk a lot about what BDP and Public Enemy did, you mm-hmm. know, along with Rakim and others. Mm-hmm. But I mean, mm-hmm. there was no strong, popular, cultural, revolutionary, positive force. I mean, even like we love Minister Farrakhan. Who would we be without Minister Farrakhan in, in that generation? Absolutely. But how was the youth really going to continue to hear about Minister Farrakhan? It's from KRS and Chuck and like people talking about him and sampling him. And, Absolutely. You know, the fact that he gave a platform to hip hop and hip hop gave a platform to to the nation of Islam. And we all knew about, we all knew about Malcolm because of of the hip hop that we were listening to. Like mm-hmm. you may be connected to, to you know, elders that might teach you about something like that mm-hmm. or have some like, you know, Afrocentric or, or Pan-African kind of educational thing you're around. But I mean, we all knew Malcolm because of, and then that leads to Spike Lee's movie. And yes. I mean, just the number of lives that have been touched um, and the number of directions that hip hop could have gone. You think about every other type of black music that was stolen, co-opted, and watered down by the time it hit the public. Right. Because there's KRS, Chuck D, Rakim, Queen Latifah, uh, you know, Ice T, Scarface. Because of the mm-hmm. fact that those people exist, it, it couldn't be. You know, you can you can make other forms of of hip hop if you want that don't have any knowledge or, or positivity in them, mm-hmm. but everybody knows that that's an intrinsic part of the culture. And right. So I mean, not only what the things that have happened in Europe, but really all of our lives, man. Yes. Yes. The reason that we want to be good people is because we want to be like you and your brother, and and like we want to we still in life are trying to be you know, to grow up and be our heroes. And and you can't do that without being a person of integrity and without being a person of that's about your community and that's about your faith and to know what you believe, you know, not just given to you by the world, but you got to create your own curriculum in life and mm-hmm. all of this stuff, man. It's extremely you know, powerful. Uh, some ways that I judge MCs, not judge, but in my own evaluation of MCs, is what did you do when you had the mantle? Right. When, That's right. when, when you had the joystick and That's you right. was moving the culture, what, what did you do with it? Mm-hmm. You know, did you just get money and, 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 and leave? Or did you put people on? Or did, you know, like KRS and Chuck, did you teach the children and, and raise the standards? Or rock him, raise the wordplay? You know, did you do these things when you had it, or did you just get money and get a big chain and just step off, you know? And I, I look at a lot of MCs like that. Like, what did you do when you had the, the 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 wheel? When you had the wheel, what did you do? And, you know, that's just me. That's how I look at it. You know, I think so much about the fact, and I'm glad that you talked about this, that, because I've heard this before, but you saying it really drove it home, that, you know, we all know that KRS came out. It's almost like a Malcolm X story. He came out battling Shan. He came out, you know, really like burrow on burrow type of situation, mm-hmm. like battling and knocking somebody out, mm-hmm. taking somebody out, and really taking out the most one of the most popular and and respected crews at that time. Yes. Like everybody got it except for Kane. And now we know right. that him and Kane were are like dear friends to this day. Right. But I mean, you know, Shan got it. So this one got it. That one got it. Right. Roxanne Shantae got caught right. up in it, you know. Right. And Innocent I bystander. Hey, I love hearing him <laughs> tell that story about about being in the in the bank, and she, yo, who are who are you who are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. She ran up on him. Mm. Yeah, he told me that story too. Like I saw him maybe like two days after that happened back in the uh, day, and he told uh, me like, yo, Shantae ran up on me in the bank. It was crazy. It's just funny, man. And she's like five foot nothing. You know what I mean? And the she ten- was pissed. Oh man. As she should be, as she should have been. That was a powerful statement Chris made in The Bridge is Over. She had nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing. Honestly, Shan had nothing to do with it. Mm. 
You know, if you look back at the whole thing, it was really Mr. Magic was the catalyst for a whole series of events. But, you know, I don't want to give it away too much, but Mr. Magic was the guy who set the whole chain of events. Poor Shan, poor Shantae, poor Marley, <laughs> really. So he comes in the game battling, and mm-hmm. then he does the album Criminal Minded. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, and, and he's that dude. Now there's little, there are glimpses for sure in Criminal Minded that there's more to this man, to this mm-hmm. lyricist. DJ mm-hmm. Scott LaRock has a college degree and blast master, all inside, the, mm-hmm. you know, like he's right. saying so much, but what we heard later and what you confirmed in the book is that, so then the second album, once he's got the, the, the ears and the hearts of the street, like once he's proven himself that, that like I'm battle tested, I'm nasty, mm-hmm. I'm vicious on this mic. I get, you know, uh, Melly Mel can challenge me at the LQ and I'm, I'm not backing down. Right, you know what I'm right. saying? Like, it doesn't matter. Like I'm the man, I'm dope. You got to respect me. Then once right. he has all that, then the second album is by any means necessary. My philosophy. And the fact that he references Malcolm very directly and then you know, and and uh, Public Enemy, their first album wasn't as overtly black conscious as the, as Takes a Nation of Millions was. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. so, like these guys come in the door, they get the respect, they they do all the things in the culture and in the street world that are necessary to do. And but mm-hmm. then the second they, like you said, once their hand is firmly on the joystick, it's like okay, now it's knowledge time, it's it's mm-hmm. it's character and values time, it's respect mm-hmm. women time, it's black mm-hmm. empowerment time, it's history time, it's education time, it's mm-hmm. you you know, and so to to know from you, you know, um, clarifying it and making it known that he actually had that most of that album written when he did the first joint, when he did the first incredible, and he was only twenty one years old, by the way. Mm. He wrote actually he wrote a lot of Criminal Minded when he was twenty. It came out when he was twenty one. You know, I look sometimes you look at like Rakim was like nineteen. When he made paid in full, like these were kids, really. If you look in the scheme of life, these were young guys. And a guy like Kairos, he's 21 years old. And he already has this whole, the stop the violence movement, all of these things in his mind already at 21 years old is incredible. But then he comes with a whole different style first. Right. Criminal minded style, and then he c- flips and comes with a completely different style, and they're both incredibly successful. It's unbelievable, man. That's why I look at sometimes I look at him, I'm like, this is unbelievable. Like, if I didn't know you, I'm just looking at you objectively. This is an unbelievable artist to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to ask two, two things about just you observing him and, and your, your love for him. Mm-hmm. You talk about being so worried for him and then so happy for him. It really feels like uh, just observing it that there's almost like a like this dynamic where in some ways like he's very clearly the big brother, mm-hmm. but especially when y'all were younger, it feels almost like like you almost felt like a caretaker of him. Absolutely, that actually that when we were younger, I was the lead more because we were only we we're only ten months apart. Right. So we all right. So we almost didn't have like a big brother, young. It was almost like equals. Mm. But I was the one who had all the friends. I was the one who had all did all the activities, and I brought him with me. Let's go play ball. Let's go hang out with this guy. Come over here with me to this place. You know, he always followed me. He didn't really have that many friends until hip hop. It's like I was the lead all the way up until he grabbed the mic, and then he became the lead. You know what I mean? Like, even out the first guys who he rhymed with, like, the first DJ guys that he knew, these were my friends from my class. You know, these were my guys who I delivered newspapers with. I'm like, oh, by the way, my brother's an MC. Oh, I got some records. Bring them over to my house. And that's how he started making tapes, making tapes with my friends. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was, yeah, like you said, I worried about him because, like, I was, I was, like, the good kid. I had the good grades. You know, I was, you know, I delivered papers. I was the kid that did everything society would consider the norm, where he was like the black sheep. And it seemed like it was your role to appease your mom and whatever stepdad was in the at, in the situation at the time. It seems like yeah. you were the one that was going to know what to say to them to try to get them as calm as possible, to try to make yeah. them open up a little bit. Yeah. So, 
like it really feels like you're in a caretaker role in the earlier yeah, was, part I, of life. Yeah, I was always the mediator between my mother and my brother. It always seemed, I don't know how I got thrust into that role, but I, I was always the guy who, you know, go talk to her. You know, it's going to be okay. He didn't mean it. He's going to be fine. You know, then I run back to my brother. She said this, you know, this, this, you know, you need to get yourself together. You know, that. then I run back to her. He said, okay, you know, it's going to be, and then they'll, you know, they'll make, you know, that was always my role as well too growing up. You know, it's just, you know, it's funny you know, how, how it happened. One of the things that we hear, and I think that, that like I wouldn't have known was mm -hmm. that you all were present in the Bronx living next door to 1520 Sedgwick when the first hip hop parties were happening. Yes. So you, like you all lived in the Bronx and you lived in the Bronx. Like you lived like four train, like the Bronx. Yes. But most of your childhood was not in the Bronx. It was like, a lot of it was Brooklyn. Seems like most of the time was Brooklyn. Yes. There was a time in Harlem, a little bit of time in the Bronx. But KRS obviously identifies so much with the Bronx. And I wonder, is it possible, and is that maybe because of the fact that the group home seems to have been when he became, when he came into his own as an individual, as a man, and that's in the Bronx. So yes. Like, so, because you got like the Larry years almost, and 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 mm -hmm. being, you know, being bullied and being being an outcast and all that stuff, and then whatever happens in those two years in that group home with Scott Rock and that and that situation, now is the emergence of of Chris. Is that? Do you think that's why he identifies so much with the Bronx? Absolutely. I mean, I think he found himself in the Bronx, and you know, also he wanted to be an MC in Brooklyn in the early '80s. Rap wasn't really in Brooklyn like that. You know, Bronx was still the main focus of hip hop. I mean, it was in the outer barrels, but not like the Bronx. So if you're in Brooklyn trying to be an MC and that's what you want to do, there's a lot of resistance. There's not a lot of real people to talk to. But then when he went to the Bronx as a teen and he got, you know, hip hop is everywhere. So it's like, oh, this is where I, this is where I need to be. It's not Brooklyn. The Bronx is really where it's supposed to be. And like you said, in the group home, he found himself. He found his name, KRS, you know, everything there. So he he relates more to the Bronx. But you that relate to Brooklyn. Point. Yeah, I'm a like, Brooklyn Like guy you identify with Brooklyn. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I went to high for, school For in better Brooklyn. and worse and everything Right, else. right, right, right. Exactly. For better, for better or worse, I'm a Brooklyn. I went to high school in Brooklyn, born and raised. You know, even though we lived the next door to Cool Herc, on the day, August 11th, 1973, Chris and I were probably in front of his building that day playing with on our big wheel. You know, we was we played in front of Cool Herc's building every single day. You know, it was just the thing to do. And, you know, we probably saw Cool Herc, you know, up and down. We, we were little, I was six years, I, I think I just turned seven on August 11th. Chris was still seven too. So we were both seven years old. So, you know, at that time, you didn't go where grownups went. Like if grownups were over there, you better be over there. You know what I mean? Like you didn't, you didn't do what they did. So the older guys like Herc and I were probably like over there and we were probably were like over here, but we were right there. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's wild to hear you to say that, you know, and you really identifying with Brooklyn, like I said, for better or worse, because you're just like, man, Brooklyn is going to mess up the Latin quarter. We're not going to have this anymore. And it's going to be because of Brooklyn and, it's a trip, but then also for you to to really to talk that way because for you know I, I grew up in the Midwest, so New York mm -hmm. to me is like it's a place that I visit. My wife's family is from there, and like mm -hmm. I said, her her family. So I you know I talk to her aunts and uncles and and older brothers and stuff about mm -hmm. what was happening in the Bronx at that time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know that there are people in Brooklyn that talk about Grandmaster Flowers that that really are opposed to that narrative that hip hop right. started in the Bronx and that it was only in the Bronx. So what what do you when when you hear that particular like counter narrative to the like cool her, cool herc bam flash you know that KRS is such a champion of that particular narrative like how does that sit with you and 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 what role do you think that they play? Well, I I'm going to be honest. I'm not too versed in Grandmaster Flowers. I've heard his name, but I'm not too versed in what he did in the early years, so I'm, I'm not going to comment. But let me say mm -hmm. this about Herc. I think it was the combination of what he did that that is considered hip-hop. I mean, there were other DJs 
There were other guys with sound systems, but there were other guys who might have played breaks. I don't know if they were. Um, Herc might have been the guy who was playing the breaks, though. It was a combination of things. He was a DJ. He threw the party. He had a guy on the mic who was called an MC, hyping it up. He played the break records. All of this at one time is why I think August 11th is considered that day. You know, mm -hmm. there were other guys probably doing other things. I don't know. Maybe, you know, some people talk about there was a guy in Queens. You know, there was, there's always going to be a guy who did something. Some guy was playing disco records over here. Sure, I'm sure there were. But I think the combination of what Herc did and his influence, because after that day, Everybody else was like, I want to do what he's doing. They weren't saying, yo, this guy, Grandmaster Flowers, I want to do him. Maybe guys in Brooklyn were. But when Herc did what he did, that's when other people said, okay, I'm doing that right there. And that expanded into what we know as hip hop. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Herc the mantle and the respect as the founder of hip hop. And the, and the guys, most of the people who were there, gives him the mantle as well. I mean, you have some outliers and, you know, no disrespect to Flowers. I don't know much about you, Flowers. I don't know, no disrespect to people who think he's the guy, but most of the people who were there in, in New York give it to Herc. And for what I understand, it was a combination of things he did. So, who Herc? <laughs> you know, and, and even, you know, Herc being from Jamaica and the... That style of like chatting mm -hmm. over the records mm -hmm. and the dub mm -hmm. plates and the like. There's mm -hmm. such a like hip hop and dance hall are first cousins or maybe even yeah. like, you know, uh, like like uh, brothers the way that you and Chris are. Like they're so yeah. they're so they're closely so related closely to each related. other. Related, yes. On that note, man. So like, I know that there are people that like hip hop historians say that that there were other people blending hip hop and reggae, but it didn't reach the world. It didn't reach us the way that it did when KRS did it. Exactly. Like for us to hear, you know, but bye bye and all like those kind of like and him like, you know, I didn't even know. I wasn't even because you know living in the Midwest, like I wasn't really even aware of dance hall and reggae the way that I that I became I became familiar through uh BDP and through hip hop music mm -hmm. and even you saying on on the live hardcore worldwide are y'all up on reggae and like the crowd <laughs> does not give you an adequate response I said are y'all up on reggae and the crowd's like yes okay um, <laughs> That's funny. but man and and so I always wondered I'm like man are these guys Jamaican and but then hearing and like reading in the book about your stepfather this Jamaican man that your mother was with and he came in the mm -hmm. house and knew he had to be cool and clean and debonair and nice around your mom. But then, mm -hmm. you know, it more and more starts coming out more of his. And I mean, this man seems like he had some very deep psychological disorder. Yes. Because I mean, the the level of the level of abuse that you described, not only mental, uh, physical, but also mental and emotional. And I want to mm -hmm. say to you, man, because sometimes, you know, people describe, like we describe what happens to us as kids and mm -hmm. we wonder, like, do people believe us? I don't know if you need to hear it or not, man, but I believe you, man. I Thank believe you. you. I like that has you. the ring of truth, you know, of, you. Of, of what you experienced. But this is the guy that introduced Patois and, and Bob Marley and Rastafari. And like, this is the guy that introduced all this stuff to you. And I wonder the fact that KRS ends up being so synonymously tied with dance hall. Do you think there's an element of that where he's like reclaiming uh, this thing that's this like this horrible, horrific, terrifying presence in his life as a child? That like now it's be, it's part of the of the myth and the superhero ness of KRS One. Absolutely, that's possible. I mean, I don't know where this the boisterous KRS One came from mm. because the, the the Larry that I know was is nothing like KRS One, and you know that's why I, I, I always when I see him on stage, when I used to see him on stage, I used to be like. That I don't know that guy. You know mm. what I mean? Th th that guy is different than the guy I know. That's why I was so, I used to be so worried when he would grab the mic because I'm like, 
you know, my my quiet brother is about to rap. Like, is he going to be okay? You know what I mean? And then KRS one, you know, rah, you're like, okay. You know what I mean? So, so it's very possible that either he is battling his stepfather subconsciously or take embodying him or taking bits. All of that is possible. You know, we're just speculating, but it's very possible, but he definitely took a liking to reggae music, and it was definitely introduced to us by this man, Bob Marley, and the whole Rastafarian culture. Yeah. Yeah. So he he shouts you out as a Rasta on the record on word from our sponsor. <laughs> My brother is a Rasta. So did, do you still identify as a Rasta? I have not been a Rasta since... That one summer when my stepfather had us big rosters, I um. So you're hearing this like, oh, I'm a roster now, or is it, yeah, basically, <laughs> is this some basically, other brother? Is this like basically, or maybe he's apparently about ICU, ICU is your brother now right, too, right? right. Yeah. yeah, right. Maybe he's talking about ICU. His 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 closest friend, his, to me, his first real friend, um. Mm. Uh, because most of the friends that we had growing up were my friends. Like I said, these are all my friends that became his friends. I see you as the first person that he introduced to me as his friend that I didn't know, you know, shout out to ICU. Um, but yeah, maybe he met ICU as a roster. I, I don't know the lyrics, the words. I don't know. I'm gonna have to ask him about that. And I'm always quizzing Chris about lyrics, by the way, I'm always on. Why did you say this? Why did you feel this? Why do we, we've, we've had long discussions over one bar in his rhymes at times, just getting deep with it. Like, why do you say this? And we're all, you know, we've been arguing about hip hop since, you know, we were little kids. So we always have different opinions. You know, it's hilarious actually. Listen to us argue, you know, it's funny. One of the really touching moments is where, when he shouted you out on the record, but he also called Just Ice, or uh, called uh, ICU his brother. My brother's mm-hmm. name is Kenny. He's Kenny Parker. My other brother, I see you, is much darker. Mm-hmm. The fact that you're like, because some people might have felt like, how am how, this guy is just your friend? Like I've been your brother since ten months after you were here. How is this guy? But in your mind, it felt like I'm not only his blood brother, but he's putting me in a line directly next to his best friend. So like, not mm-hmm. only am I akin to him, but he actually loves me, and is mm-hmm. proud to be proud to be with me. You know, Mm -hmm. and and over the years, the way that he championed you, you know, uh, you talk about one of the things that you say, man, that that I I cried a lot reading this book. Um, But one of the one of the moments that you describe is your last game as a as a uh, college as a college college player Mm -hmm. and the way that the coach fronted on you and everything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just this moment of you realizing like this part of my life is coming to a close and it's never going to be like this again. Mm-hmm. I don't I think it's very rare that we have those moments, but I think it was one of the, uh, was it your graduation or one of the joints that that he showed up? My graduation. It was my graduation. Yeah, I didn't even know that uh, he was going to be able to make it. I mean, I, I don't want, I don't want to kill a tearjerk. I don't want, I don't want to kill it for people, but um it's a touching moment because when I graduated and I didn't know he was going to show up and he was just there. I don't even want to tell, say how he got there, but he was there in the crowd and it was in just, style. you know, yeah, it was just amazing that he even made it, you know, cause he was so busy at the time and he found time to come to that. It was just dope. It's a dope moment. And in the context of just knowing like, man, the fact that like this is your one and only family member that's actually there for you and loving you yeah. and yeah after everything that you guys have been through together and separately that like it feels like to me like this is a very cl- clear moment that <laughs> these people didn't beat you these people never beat y'all yeah they yeah. weren't able to stop you yeah even yeah, if absolutely. even if your beloved mother like it, it wasn't trying to stop you like that would have been so crushing for a lot of people. It would be, right. you would not need to explain how you didn't recover from that. Right. And then all of these crazy, like the way you de- detail each year and like all of the horrific traumatic things that happen at the end of each year. And then the year start changing. Then the re- the yearly recaps start being like, I went on tour. Da, 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 da. Right. And so to me, it feels like that right. moment, like you said, people can read it in the book, but 
the fact that you're graduating, that he shows up, and just the the time that you all had and like how that must have felt, man. It's just yeah, I mean, he showed up in style and you know, at, at this point he's he's I think was ghetto music out. No, Getting Music was about, so he's two albums in and Self-Destruction was out. You know, he's huge at this point. I mean, when he came to my graduation, it was like, yo, you know, I, you know, this giant star, everybody was taking pictures. But, but, you know, but for us, it was just like, you know, it was seeing him in the crowd was the moment. You know, he mm-hmm. was there clapping, you know, all the families are clapping and he was there clapping and he's looking down at me and I'm waving at him. And it was just like, you know, like I did it, like, you know, we made it. You know, who would have thunk that we both would be even be here at this moment, considering where we came from? Yeah, it was a great moment. I didn't even realize it till you said it, you know. Yeah, it was a great moment. Yeah, man. I definitely was like, I definitely had to stop reading for a second. Like, it was definitely like some, it definitely was some water hitting the... <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We're sponsored by BetterHelp, and we make a commission if you use our link to sign up. Uh, If you haven't had a chance to check out last week's episode, I recommend that you might want to do that. It's a solo episode where I open up like never before about my own relationship with food and my body and with other people and my mental health journey and specifically my experiences and just the really profoundly like enlightening and freeing experience that I've had in therapy. Um... Man, there's this old way of looking at therapy. There's this old kind of like view that I used to have of therapy. Like you lay on a couch and this like Sigmund Freud kind of figure asks you these questions and you find out what's wrong with you and they give you the secrets to, and they tell you that this is the way you need to approach life and you learn what's wrong with you and how broken you are and what damaged goods you are. And you're there because obviously you're crazy and, you know. And I mean, from my wife being a therapist and her circle of friends and so many therapists that I know, I've just learned that there are so many different approaches to therapy and it's really a type of self-care. You know, I I talked in last week's episode about the fact that I've always carried a lot of extra weight and I've just been out of shape. And so when I came, when my family and I moved to Istanbul, Turkey, I got a chance to get a trainer. And I just, the trainer is walking me through step by step how to just increase my core strength and my balance and my relationship with my muscles and the the right foods for me to eat and things like that. You know, I thought that I was going to get in there and start doing a bunch of push-ups and bench presses. And I thought it was going to look like what it would look like on TV. But if you get a good trainer, they can teach you about your specific body for what your needs are. My trainer knows that I'm partially blind. So you, you can't just have me doing all the stuff that everybody else does. A therapist Therapists now are much more like that, where there are all these different approaches and techniques and personality types and different focuses that different types of therapists have. And what so many of us are experiencing is that we don't have access or don't know how to access therapy. To treat it as a form of self-care and of self-love and investment in self, you know, that it doesn't have to be this really kind of mechanical, medical type of uh, approach, but really just like all of us as people are experiencing so much. We're taking on so much in terms of, you know, from the very beginning of our lives to now all through the pandemic and all these different issues we have. And each of us really deserve to have access to sit with a person, to ask us the right questions, to just unlock some of the... (sighs) some of the secrets that we keep from ourselves, some of the uh, frame framing that we have of ourselves that might we might be holding ourselves back. You know, I learned that I've been holding myself back in so many areas in so many ways. And I've kind of always known that, but I haven't known how to look at it. And I've been scared to look at it. So what BetterHelp does, if you go to betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R, help, H-E-L-P, dot com slash travelers, that's the link that you can use 
uh, to, to acknowledge the partnership that our podcast has with BetterHelp. And when you do that, BetterHelp actually sponsors the show. So when you go and you use that link to inquire, to sign up, to start your, your conversation with them, they actually contribute to this podcast. If you don't use that link, then it's good. It's great. But like, they're not going to know that uh, them supporting this podcast is actually helping specifically to get the word out. So you go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, and then you start with this questionnaire that asks you about yourself, what your background is, and then it asks you, what are your preferences for therapy? Would you rather talk to a man or a woman? What are the things that are bringing you to this uh, to this stage of investing in yourself? They'll ask about what are the issues that are bringing you here? Are you interested in trauma? Are you? Do you want to talk about addiction? Do you want to talk about sexual violence? Do you want to talk about specific types of trauma? Do you want to talk about relationships? Do you want to talk about, uh, you know, are, are you having suicidal thoughts? What are the things that are bringing you here? And then you go to a point where you schedule your own appointments and you schedule the type of appointment you have. You can uh, look at your therapist face-to-face on your phone or tablet or or computer. Uh, You can also talk to your therapist on the phone without the visual part. And you can even text and do voice notes and things like that. The other thing that's really cool about it is that you can change therapists whenever you want. It's literally an option that they offer you all the time. Do you want to change therapists? I initially forgot to say that I preferred to talk to a man just because, um, you know, it can be really intimate and I just, I I didn't want to have the added layer of like, am I going to be, if I'm talking to a woman, am I going to be, is it going to bring up certain things for me? But I forgot to mark that when I did my, uh, my original questionnaire. And so the first person they suggested was a woman. And this woman is not from my background, um, like culturally. Um, you know, we're not from the same religious background, but I know that like, if I have a conversation with her and it doesn't feel like the right fit, I can always change. It's very easy. Like it's a click of a button and they're like, okay, cool. And you, you just get a different therapist to try out. But I figured, let me have one conversation with this woman. I talked to her y'all and the question, she, we just got straight to work. I explained to her the reason that I was there and she started asking questions based on what I said. And in my first one hour meeting with my therapist, I learned so much about myself and it was directed by me. It's not like she was engineering these questions because of some agenda she was trying to push on me or a narrative she was trying to push. I mean, this woman is amazing. <laughs> like, I, I had a session with her last night and every time I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's amazing. It's been real. My own experience with BetterHelp has been incredible. If you go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, fill out the questionnaire. They give you a discount because of the fact that that we led you there. Um, and then they also give us, you know, some support as well for the podcast. I couldn't recommend it more highly. We all have the right. We all have the right. We all have the right to talk to somebody who's trained in helping us to see ourselves in a different way, to experience ourselves in different ways, and to to unlock our fuller potential and just give us the ability to live without these frameworks and confusion and deny self-doubt and you know uh, unprocessed, unmetabolized traumas. Couldn't recommend it more highly. Betterhelp.com slash travelers. One of the things that we always talk about on this podcast is there's just the reality that things that we do every day and that we almost take for granted, if those things can come in with added intention and attention, and we just start thinking more and being more present with the things that we do, we can actually transform those mundane things into sacred rituals that add meaning to our lives and rec- recognize meaning in our lives. And that just do a little something to to make us more present, you know, as we move through our day to day activities. So, uh, Mystic Man, if you go to Mystic M Y S T I C dash Man dot com, you'll see that there's this whole line of products that help men groom, particularly uh, with our beards. 
Uh, this is a company that was started by a friend of mine that I've known for well over 10 years named Justin Mashouf, uh, Iranian American brother. Um, he's a B-boy documentary, documentary filmmaker, super dope, just really dope dude. He's one of these people that like everybody knows him, everybody likes him. He's just a positive addition to whatever situation he's in. He's from the culture, you know, we share our love for the Islamic tradition. You know, one of the things that we do is we really want to imitate the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because everything he did was virtuous. Everything he did was thoughtful and intentional and beautiful. And so, so much of emulating even the little things that he did, peace be upon him, it helps us to beautify our lives and enrich our lives. And so that's really where this all this stuff is rooted. The, pro, the products that Justin produces and offers us are... Uh, based on sacred cedar. And cedar has these healing properties. It smells amazing. You know what I'm saying? And it just really helps to bring about an atmosphere, an environment, a practice, a day-to-day -day embodied living practice of being intentional about the type of men that we want to be, the ways that we want to show up in the world, you know, the the impact and the effect that we have on others, you know? And so... Uh, this is a product that I use and I've used it for a long time. Like I've, I've used Mystic Man for a long time. Our, our dear brother, shout out to my man, Dr. Sohail Dolez. I just went back the who wrote Black Star Crescent Moon. He has a, uh, a super dope um, museum, like, like museum exhibit that he does on the link between hip hop and Islam. And there's a book of it that you can see called Return of the Mecca. Just extra little shout out for to Sohail. But Sohail actually came from California to hang out with uh, some of us in Istanbul for a couple of weeks. And he brought us care packages of Mystic Man. So I got a re-up and I'm back like fully rocking my Mystic Man joint here in Istanbul, Turkey. So head to mystic-man.com. When you get to the checkout section, put in travelers as the code and you'll get a little something off because of the fact that we're cool like that. Much love, special shout out to to mystic man. What what did it mean for I mean you know you 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 came up you were the guy that even before you were a DJ you're recording red alert mm -hmm. for everybody else is going out on Saturday nights and you're staying in and recording red alert but then on Monday morning you're like you're the guy that's got the red alert tape. Yeah. And then you know red alert is a part of BDP. And you're, you know, rooming with him sometimes on the road and mm -hmm. like you're in the, in the studio with him while he's mixing and, mm -hmm. you know, all of this stuff. What did it mean for you? And then also what did it mean for BDP for, for a cultural tastemaker? And like he was very clear, uh, clearly a leader of the culture. Yes. And the fact that like Juice Crew, for example, had Mr. Magic, like like they had that in with Mr. Magic. So they had... A, a real life gatekeeper saying like, yes, these people are official. Like what mm -hmm. did it mean for you personally, but also for BDP to have Red Alert as like an in-house elder champion spokesman, like validating the crew and putting the stamp on the crew? Well, first of all, I don't know if people realize how important Red Alert is to the culture. Mm -hmm. When New York City Radio decided that they were going to put a mix show on the air, prime time, prime time meaning like 12, 11, 12, on a, on a major radio station. At this point, rap music did not get any radio play at all, maybe one or two records per year. Red Alert was almost an experiment. If Red Alert and shout out Marley Mall as well on BLS, but if these guys failed, hip hop would have failed. But because these guys excelled and the ratings were so high, mainstream radio decided, okay, let's take a chance on hip hop and let this guy plays what he wants. So now Red Alert is so popular that if he played your record two weeks in a row, it was a hit. That was as big as it got because there was no mainstream. So Red Alert was the pinnacle of, of radio play. I listened to Red Alert every single week of my life that I wasn't, didn't have a basketball against him. I was listening to Red Alert on a Saturday night. So he was that important to me. Fast forward to BDP comes out 
And I remember, you know, my brother told me that they were going to play, Red Alert was going to play his record on the radio. My first question was, you know Red Alert? Like, that's like, you know, you, you know, you know, the president of the United States. Like, to me, it doesn't get bigger than Red Alert. So and he's like, yeah, he's going to play my record. I keep in mind, there was only two outlets. So if Mr. Magic or Red Alert don't play a record, you would not have come out. You would have never been heard. So for Red Alert to embrace the South Bronx song, and then the bridge is over, he took that as his personal record and mm. blew it up. It meant everything to BDP. He really started Boogie Down Productions, and it, it, it was like, Almost like they were intertwined because then Chris brought him into the fold and made him bigger nationally. So it's like they both introduced each other to their audiences. It was incredible. Um, I saw Red Alert just the other day. I saw Red Alert t- two days ago. Um, shout out to him. And every time I see Red Alert, I salute him as a friend and as a, as, as a, as a gatekeeper to the culture as an icon and as a person who influenced me because I was practically Red Alert on Monday because I would take Red Alert on Saturday and on Monday, I was Red Alert. You had to come to my dorm room to hear what was hot. Right, I was the connect because everybody else would be out on Saturday night, you know, living there, you know, everybody else, you know, 18, 19, 20, they're outside doing whatever you do on Saturday night. To me, Red Alert was more important than anything going on outside. So Monday morning, I was red alert. I was the gatekeeper of my college. So, you know, he was that important to me and to Chris, to my whole family. Shout to red alert, man. Absolutely. You know, so I heard Red Alert's name. Like if you were in hip hop, if you cared anything about hip hop, you read it on the back of records and you heard, like we knew about him. But the first time I ever heard that, yes, like his voice yes. was, on, was on BDP records. And um, man, when I when I first started touring, um, so uh, one of the first like real ones to take me out was Rakim. Rakim took me out on tour, and I oh. toured I toured with him for two full years. And um, on that first tour, Red Alert would like would just pop up in different cities. Mm-hmm. And so the first couple of times I met him was just like, "Peace, Red Alert. How are you, sir?" You know. And he would just be like, hey there, young man. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, and then he saw me rhyme one time. And I got off stage and he was like, he was like, shit, you actually pretty dope. You don't, you don't look like you can really rap like that. Did you see him? Did you see him? And he's like talking to people. He's like, this motherfucker just, just got up there and rap. I can't believe it. That's crazy. How'd you, you know what I mean? You, 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 you look like you should write nursery rhymes or something. Like he was kind of clowning me, but but it was right, like right. it was red alert saying, like, you're good at this. Right, right, and right. And man, then we got to Atlanta or something, and he would just pop up in certain cities. Mm-hmm. We got to Atlanta and he and he he was carrying some stuff in, and I was like, Man, let me carry that for you. And he just goes, Hey, brother Ali, how you been? And I was like, uh, I'm retired as of today. Like that's you know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. He says your name, right? Dude, Dope. yeah, man. Dope. I, I think Red Alert is one of those people because he also he's much, he's a lot like Q-Tip in the sense that the, both of them ushered in a lot. I forget. I, mm-hmm. Maybe maybe Buster was saying this, but you know, like we we know and for Dre because Dre, Dr. Dre on the West Coast always had connections to these business opportunities. So mm-hmm. when someone like Eminem or 50 Cent or Snoop Dogg came along or DOC or CPO, like all these people, mm-hmm. he could put them on and then his name was attached to those projects. Mm-hmm. But somebody like Red Alert, like BDP were some of the first ones, I guess Jungle Brothers also, mm-hmm. you know, but but Red Alert had so much to do with so many things, much like Q-Tip, where like mm-hmm. we don't always realize these people that not only did they do amazing work in and on their own, but that they've been so instrumental in some of the yeah. absolute giants. Yeah, had their and hands. That's what real things, DJs right? are, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the the DJ for BDP is Scott LaRock. Again, rest yes. in peace. Yes. And it's amazing to think about the trajectory of BDP in terms of content. You know, so you know, for some people to say, "Well, I did Criminal Minded, but I already had any means necessary written." I don't mm-hmm. know if I'd believe anybody, just anybody saying that. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you have this, like, this philosopher MC, and you know, we're talking about these programs and what they did for young men and what they did for you and your brother, and mm-hmm. the fact that, like, Scholar Rock literally is the social worker at a group home, and you describe the men's that- shelter. 
He's yeah, at the, the men's, shelter. Not even the group home. He was at the men's shelter. Oh, the men's Bronx shelter. One. Yes, that's right. Because Chris mm -hmm. took you to the the Manhattan one. Right. Right. When you, to, so that you could get in, uh, inducted into the system and so that you could get right. in. Right. Right. Because I was okay. a minor at that point. Okay. But Scott was right. at, so he wasn't even at the group home. He was at the, 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 shelter, the men's shelter with, in with, the Bronx. With, yeah. With men. Yeah. With, with over 21, I guess. Over 20, something. Over 18. Yeah. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. And so him and, him and KRS meet each other. They didn't like each other. At it's all. It's like, this, this guy is too much of an authoritarian and he's too strong willed. Right, they don't get along. But then, as soon as he realizes that that Chris can rhyme, then he he starts thinking not only as a DJ but also as a social worker. And the two of them are so much. Those two roles, like DJs, man, in a lot of ways are like the social workers, the cultural curators of the culture. Yes, you know what I'm saying. We talk about who Red Alert is, and the fact that Red Alert is like, no, these these uh, tribe called Quest guys, they need to be, and De La Soul needs to be part of this, and mm -hmm. just you know, or or Bambada being able to see like, okay, this graffiti art, these dudes that write on the train, and the people that spin on their head, and the DJs and the guys that rap over it, they're all part of a similar culture, like the the. The, the community organizing element of all of this stuff, the, the deeply like African communal element of it all, man, is just mm -hmm. mind boggling, man. Mind boggling. DJs are like Red Alert, they, have, they meet and connect with a lot of different people in different genres and they can bring people together. Like they can say, you DJ, I need to connect you with this MC because they deal with DJs and MCs. And then they deal with record company guys who brings them records all the time. So they could talk to these guys and they deal with promoters because they spin in clubs. So they could talk to these guys where individually these guys might never talk, but they all talk to DJs. So a DJ is like a center point for all other parts of the culture, in my opinion. So they can bring, you know, let me, Red could say, you know, Q-Tip, you need to meet Jungle Brothers or, you know, he brought 45 King, an unknown guy. Come up, play your demos on Kiss FM. 45 King becomes an incredible producer. That's Red Alert. That's the, that's the most underrated producer in hip hop, man. Ever. Ever. Incredible, incredible guys that, you know, I remember going up to Kiss FM to see Red Alert and... Mr. Long from Black Sheep was just there, a guy just hanging out. And he's asking me, hey, man, I make beats. Listen to my beats and tell me what you think. I'm still in college. And, you know, this guy, Mr. Long, you know, we're coming out with a group called Black Sheep. You know, good luck with, you know, good luck. A couple years later, engine, engine, number nine. You know, it's like all these people were hovering in Red Alert's orbit. You know what I mean? And he was able to connect. It's brilliant. I mean... You know, like you say, Africa Bambada, you know, these type of guys connected a lot of people that wouldn't have normally been connected. And most of the most of the amazing MCs from that time are also DJs. Like Kaz is an amazing DJ. Like yeah. Chris taught you how to DJ in a lot of ways. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Rakim it, like did the cut, a lot of the cuts on his own record. Chris, yes. I, I never knew until you said it in that. I don't know how I never knew this, but the the you're a philosopher. You fit yes. You fit you fit yeah. Like you said, Chris did those cuts. Chris did those cuts. Crazy man. Absolutely. Crazy. Absolutely. You know, so many of them are so many of them are also amazing DJs, but I just you know then then uh, Scott LaRock is the first time in hip hop that we had, you know, one of our heroes, that we lost one of our heroes to like street stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've had a chance to hear it, but to me, the greatest hip hop podcast of all time is the Combat Jack show. And shout to him. Man, he passed rest away, in peace. rest in peace. Yeah. Man, that was one of my dear friends. So uh, D-Nice actually tells the story on the Combat Jack show to Reggie Ose about that whole situation. And I mean, he's mm -hmm. like crying and he talks about you know, the fact that Scott was mediating uh, a, an argument between, and it was a misunderstding. Like D says like that, man, there was, I wasn't even beefing with these people. It's like this guy thought I was hollering at this girl and I wasn't, like I just knew her, like it wasn't even like that. Mm -hmm. But Scott has a, what does that mean to the culture for, for someone, for you that were there and were so closely connected to it what what did that what would what did that mean to the culture at that time to lose somebody that important in that particular way? Well, 
it brought the violence home in a way. It, it, it brought the violence to a place where it wasn't. Like New York was a very violent place. In, it, was the, it was the crime and murder capital of America in the mm-hmm. 80s. Mm-hmm. But when you went to listen to music, it was different. I got away from the violence to come over here and listen to some music and escape all the madness. But wait, somebody in, over here in the music just got killed just like people get killed out in the street. What is this? It was like it, 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 it shook up your safe place, the music. And then Scott was such a visionary. You know, I don't know where BDP and hip hop would have gone if Scott had have lived because he had so many visions and ideas of what he wanted to do. And it was all cut short. You know what I mean? Because he was the leader of BDP when he was alive. I mean, KRS picked up the mantle when he passed. And of course, Chris is a brilliant visionary as well and had a lot of ideas. But at that time, Scott LaRock was the leader of the group and the group was going in the direction that he saw and it just got cut short. And, you know, he had business deals. They had a deal on the table, a record deal on the table. You know, he wanted to do merchandise. He wanted to do other groups. He had a whole business plan that he wanted to do that got cut short. So who knows what it would have been musically as a producer you heard the criminal minded album broke trends with the music who knows what was up next actually my philosophy was up next that's a scott the rock production okay that's the last song they were working on my philosophy and i think um going way back with just ice Mm -hmm. i think those two songs were the last two songs scott was working on when he passed so you see where he was headed with it as a producer, and that got cut short too. So it was like a lot of things got cut short when he passed. Um, you talk about boogie down productions. Like I don't think that I don't. I definitely didn't realize that because KRS is such a huge presence on the record. You know, and it's interesting. Like so, you clarified a lot of things for me with that one. I didn't realize that Scott was the leader of the group. You know, and. Uh, just like I didn't realize that because I didn't understand what he was contributing in like to the record I was listening to. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the same way that I didn't realize how important uh, Eric B was in making sure that Rakim got a chance to rhyme. Right. So I'm thinking like, man, I'm listening to these scratches on these Eric B and Rakim records. I'm like, well, he's not DJ Scratch. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, right. Absolutely. Right. But Who you is, don't realize. But yeah. Right. Yeah. I love right. the way you outlined seeing DJ Scratch at the Apollo for the first time. Yeah. So amazing. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, it's, I, I really appreciate your explanation of that so that we can really understand who Scott was because I've never heard Chris necessarily say that. I've heard D-Nice talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, and I think too about how quickly Chris had to transition. Yes. Like when you, when you say that, like he had, he was gone one day and then Madison square garden is not even a week later. Right. And he's on stage giving a tribute for somebody. He just, like, he just lost his mentor that made all these things happen. Yes. Um, how does a, how how does he survive that moment? Like, how do you as a collective, like, continue working at that time? Was there an opportunity? Was, like, did you all get to grieve and mourn and, like? Well, you know, I, I can't answer that question because at that time, I wasn't in the group yet. Okay. So I'm, right. I, I'm still talking to Chris as his brother. So I don't know how he managed. I mean, you know, I, let me say this. Hip hop is all he ever wanted to do. So stopping rapping was never going to be an option for KRS-One. Even he's rap, he just dropped an album the other day. He's 56 years old. You know what I mean? It's he's never going to stop rapping. So in that respect, I don't think he would have stopped. And Scott, the type of person Scott LaRock is, he wouldn't have wanted him to stop either. So if you gave up and was like, I can't do this, you would have disrespected Scott, really, by, by not carrying on. Scott would have been looking at you like, what are you doing, man? We, 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 we're doing it. What are you doing? You know what I mean? And plus, Chris's drive, this is all he ever wanted. And imagine 
he had the By All Means Necessary album almost done in his mind when Scott passed. I have a whole new album ready to go. You know what I mean? I have to, I have to get this out. You know, so you're right. It was a quick transition. It was like one day, Scott, the next day, he's gone. What's going to happen to the group now? It's crazy. There's a line that he has that I always like have laughed about. Um, I, I think it's on still number one, but he says, I'm not a beginner, amateur or local. My album is selling, selling because of my because vocals. Of my vocals. <laughs> but, and I always felt like, dang, I wonder how Scott felt about that line. You know what I mean? Like, yo, is it? But... So I wonder about this. So when I, one of the things that you outlined that I never thought about is that the industry now is looking at this group, Boogie Down Productions, that just lost its leader and thinking, like, can they still do it? Like, can they still do it without him? So I wonder mm-hmm. if that lyric maybe had something to do with, like, don't get it twisted. Like, a big, I'm a big part of these records. You know what? Now that you mentioned it, that's probably, knowing him, that's probably what he meant. Like, you know, because... I mentioned in the book that they had a deal on the table with a major label. And when Scott passed, the major label said BDP is over. You know, which I like I always say, I thought that was a weird assumption to make. But they, you know, Scott was that important in the group to to the in- industry that Scott's gone, it's over. So I guess Chris might have been saying, my album is selling because of what I spit on these on this mic. Like, don't get it yet, yeah, don't get it twisted. I'm still dope. I could definitely, knowing his personality and now that you mentioned it, yeah, that's definitely what he meant. I'm going to say yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going, yes, final answer. Yeah, final answer. Yes. <laughs> man, so, so, man, I appreciate how, how generous you're being time. I just got a few more things I want to, no, man. No, let's go. Um, so there's a period where D-Nice is the DJ. Mm-hmm. And then he, as is his way, he works out, starts working out. So everybody in the group, D, you say you want to rhyme. Now you got a, now you got a, a, a single and you got a record deal. Go be a rapper. Stop. Right. Don't, don't you say you want to produce here? Stop the violence, like self-destruction. Like that's right. a major thing to like, not only are you producing, but like you're going to produce one of the biggest songs with like all of the biggest rappers on it. Like just his way of like throwing people in the deep end. Don't say you want to do something around him because he will toss you immediately in the deep end. Absolutely. Right into the fire. I mean, it, he did it to me as well. Yeah. Um. He, he threw me right. I mean, my first DJ gig ever was in front of 3,000 people at a BDP concert. And I was very nervous as I, as I documented. I was very nervous. I mean, he threw me right in. I made mistakes too along the way. I mean... After the book, you know, there's more, you know, but but I made some gigantic mistakes over the years and, you know, I, we had to work through them. But, um, yeah, he throws you right in the fire. I mean, he gave D-Nice a lot of responsibility early. I mean, like you said, self-destruction was the first of its kind. A posse cut uh, record like that, organizing but it was people that didn't know each other. I mean, they knew each other, but it, most posse cuts are usually people from the same crew get mm-hmm. together. These were all separate entities that had to come into the studio and record. D Nice did a fantastic job on that, by the way. Shout out to D. I was just chilling with him the other day. Shout to D Nice. I only met D Nice one time. I'm um, I'm cool with Dave Chappelle, and and um, Dave did a joint in Minneapolis one time, and and D Nice was there. And we we talked about all this stuff a little bit. It was so cool, mm-hmm. man. It's it's so dope to see somebody, you know, to become as successful and part of just popular culture as he mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. being exactly who as who he's always been. Yes, absolutely. Two three days ago, me and Derek was hanging out. D Nice was hanging out. We talked for like three hours. We caught up on like everything. And uh, he's the same. I met him when he was fifteen. You know, when I met D Nice, he was fifteen, and he looked less than fifteen. So I imagine he was 15. That was generous the way he looked. And, you know, and now to see him now is like, like you said, a, a cultural icon. I saw him on Ellen. I'm like, D-Nice is on Ellen. Not DJing, sitting down with Ellen and talking. Right. Crazy. Um, yeah, but his, his, you know, his evolution is a crazy story as well. You know, how he became the DJ and his mentor passed and he got thrust right into it, you're, t- you're filling the shoes of practically your father. Scott LaRock was practically his father. And now, here you go, go. Next album is you, go. 
crazy. And you think about, so like, so, so you, they, they did Stop the Violence, Self Destruction, the first of its kind. The West Coast did a version and Dr. Dre produced it. Imagine like that's idea. what it took to have something similar. Like you got like <laughs> right. the the most like you know one of the most well respected greatest producers of all time to do something that that's you know one of D Nice's first ever productions. Man, <laughs> yeah, that's it's that's just crazy. Like, that's mind boggling. If you really if you where you put it is mind boggling. Yes, absolutely. So you say you want to be a DJ. So suddenly he shows up at your crib with four turntables and makes one mixtape in front of you. And then one night at the hotel, you're a production manager on 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 the tour, or one of the production assistants, not even the manager. Yes, not no. You're I'm like assistant. one of the hands. You're you're there for sound check and like you mm-hmm. make sure that they're you know whatever. And then one night he just walks in, hands you a set list, and you're DJing tomorrow. Just like how you said it, and I had been DJing two months. Two months before that day, I did not know how to put a record on a needle. And two months later, I'm DJing for Boogie Down Productions. That quick, you know. But it was a lot. It was a, there was a lot of things that happened that led up to that. But basically, it happened that fast. And he threw me. He pushed me in the in the deep end of the pool, <laughs> swim or drown, <laughs> man. basically. But man, please, like, like I said, I study those records, and to this day. The DJ that I'm working with, I want him to cut the record the way that you cut the record on that. Like I literally play them the way that uh, I am a renegade teacher and scholar, and the way you cut the record, like it's it's right in sync with the way he's rhyming. Right, 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 right. Amazing, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that was the first that that album, the live album. Shout out, you know, that was the first of its kind. Nobody had done a live. Uh, hip hop album before that day, you know, and we just, I didn't even know that it, that's what it was going to be. I mean, that was a regular show for us because like they're filming the show, but he didn't say like, this is going to be an album. That was just part of a show. And then they just, next thing you know, like this is coming out. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, that's how it was back in then. It's, things were just happening so fast. I remember on the movie Juice, they're having like an event at a, they're having like a DJ event, and if you look, mm-hmm. the poster advertising that album is in is in, is in one of the main DJ scenes on Juice. I didn't see that word. Yeah, yeah. I did. How did I miss that? Man. No, I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. when um when Omar Epps is, is is DJ is is cutting. It's him and Queen Latifah. I, right. I think it's when like he's on online about to go in and and uh, audition for Queen Latifah. Okay, okay. The the that's in the background. Like the poster for the to, advertising the record. I'm gonna watch that today. I gotta see that. I need. I need that. Yeah, man, <laughs> it's amazing. And then also the way that you like your voice along with his voice. I, I feel like you might have dropped the uh, the the chorus of uh, Jimmy Hat or something of Jimmy. Like there's one part on, on on Jimmy where you're like he clearly is like distracted by something, so he's like finish the hook, and so you do it. And there's one where you. No, let me tell you <laughs> what happened. That's not yeah. me. Oh, let me tell you, is that, you know who that's that what is? No, that's Africa from the Jungle Brothers. That Whoa. is actually Africa. When um that song came on, Jimmy, Africa from the Jungle Brothers was in the house and he ran up on stage and Chris handed him the mic. Crazy. I wish they had a rec- I wish they had a recorded that part. Like the live album, some of it is on the VHS that's recorded right. and some is, is not. Mm-hmm. But Africa from the Jungle Brothers ran up and started going, Jim Browski, and he said something, Jimmy, and he just went off into another whole tangent. That wasn't me. That was Africa. Uh-huh. Shout to Africa. Shout to the JB. That's what that was. Man, I'm glad. Because yes. I wasn't going to say anything. You know what I mean? Because no, like you your performance anything. on there is so amazing. And I'm like, man, there's one part where I'm like, how do, how does Kenny Parker not, like, how did he mess no, up no, the way? Jim, And I thought, no. it, but that's perfect, man. Africa. That's wasn't crazy. me. That was Africa. Shout to Africa, Sammy B, Mike G, the whole crew. <laughs> Amazing. Incredible. Yes. So then, so then you mess around and tell your brother, man, I think I want, might want to get into making beats. So again, here's a late night visit to the hotel room with the first time seeing the SB1200. There's a beat on here. You're playing it tomorrow on stage. We had a show at Brixton Academy in, in London. 
And um, it was it was BDP and Queen Latifah featuring Moni Love. And this is when Moni Love, when they did Ladies First, and she had just blown up. And she's coming back to London for the first time. The first real London MC or UK MC to make it big in America was Moni Love. She was on Buddy. She was on Ladies First. She was on Fire. And she's coming back to London. So the show was so packed. Just, you know, everybody wanted to see BDP. Everybody wanted to see Latifah and Moni Love. Packed. We're in the hotel room. It's 3 in the morning. Chris knocks on the door. I open the door. He comes in with this machine. This is an SP-1200. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, why are you telling me? You know, <laughs> he's like, so we're going to rock this tomorrow. He plugs it in. There's a beat in here. Put these headphones on. Listen to this beat. This is start, stop. This is, this is start, this is stop. I'm going to do a freestyle tomorrow to this beat. Learn it. We're rocking it tomorrow. Good night. And just like that, BDP is rocking an SP-1200 live in front of sold out UK arena i was so nervous because you know you mess up and there's i mean at that time especially there's wolves in there there's people that want you to mess up so bad so bad you know let me tell you here's my theory about a bdp show as a dj if you don't notice me i did a great job because everybody wants to hear karis vocals they want to hear the songs they want to hear it clean so if I keep if I do a good job at keeping the music flowing clean, you're probably not going to notice me too much. If you have to notice me, that means I did something that, that that broke up the monotony. So I my thing is if you don't notice me, that means I did a good job tonight. I was clean and everything was tight. So that's how I would say if I hadn't messed up on episode 100, the whole crowd would go, you know, it's like everybody would be like, what did you know what happened? You know what I mean? So, and I've had those moments. Don't don't get it twisted. I've had some horrifying mess ups, but I, we're not gonna go into that. But I've I've had some doozies. But um, yeah, the SP twelve hundred was a was a. And then he showed me how to use it. You know, he get, actually gave it to me, and that was a two thousand dollar machine. Mm-hmm. You know, and even at the, I mean, two thousand dollar machine now is a lot. We're Back talking about 2019, $90. $90. Those are different dollars than what we got now. Right. He's like, he said, here's the SP-1200. Here's the booklet. Go. And I just started messing around with the machine. And that's how I started making music. You know, that, that was my progression. I wanted to learn how to make beats. So he's like, hey, you want to make beats here? Like, that's how he is. You want to be a DJ? Here's some turntables. Here's a mixer. Here's some speakers. Go. You want to make beats? Here's the SP-1200. Go. You know what I mean? That's how he is. Then a little while later, he'll call you back. So what do, what do you got? And, you know, the first stuff I had was the sec- stuff you heard on Sex and Violence album was like my, uh, what do you call it? Graduation mm. from him giving me the SP-1200 the year before. So that that's what it was. So. so now you got a beat on a record. Man, that song, We In There, I think it's We In There. It's one of the songs on Sex and Violence. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a, a, a freshman in high school. And this group of dudes like cornered me. They never liked me. They made up some reason to jump me. They cornered me, right. jumped me. I, my face is all messed up. My eye is full shut. I got a chipped oh. tooth. I got a, mm. you know, my eye. I, I had to get stitches in my eye. Wow. I'm, I'm like, you know, and I'm home. I get, I'm home from school for a week. And on the Sex and Violence record, he says, uh, he said, you know, from the, the smack and all that, your face will get black. You need an eye pack. Or you need an ice pack. And I'm sitting there literally holding the ice pack on my face like, this isn't as fun as listening to people rap about it. Like, this stuff's a little too real, man. I hit home. Man. But yeah, I mean, your, your, your vocal contribution on that record, you know, uh, and, the, and the music and all of that is, is really powerful, man. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And then you, uh, maybe in, like in protest or like un- undesirably helped produce Black Cop. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's a funny story. I mean, I, do we have time? I mean, please, man, please. Um, well, to make a long story short, Black Cop was a song that was supposed to be on sex and violence, but got rejected because it was done to a track that was 120 beats per minute. So that's almost like doo-doo brown, like a Luke record. <laughs> if you think about it, it's that fast. <laughs> right, right, So right. it just didn't go with sex and violence, so it got trashed. But they were doing a, um, 
movie, CB4, and they needed a BDP song. So they dug in the archive. We got this song, Black Cop. Chris, go mix this song down. Turn it in tomorrow. They're going to give it to the guys for uh, CB4. So I'm in the studio. I'm listening to the song. I'm like, Chris, this song is terrible. I'm like, it's too fast. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can't even mix this with any other song that's out. It's too fast. And he's going, it has to come out tomorrow. It, it's done. It's a done deal. Like, what are you talking about? The song is done. I'm turning it in tomorrow morning. What are you talking about? So we're arguing. I'm like, Chris, you can't give this song. And we, we argued for an hour and a half. The representative from Jive calls. It's like one o'clock in the morning just to see how the mix is going. Chris goes, I got to change the beat. It's too fast. I can't mix it with anything. I have to change the beat. And I'm sitting there like, we've been arguing about this for an hour and a half. You're telling me I'm crazy. Now you just tell Jive, yeah, I got to change the beat. I'm like, okay. He hangs up. So now he's like, okay, now what are we going to do? Let's make a beat. So I'm like, yeah, I, I found so I had some drums, a drum uh, kick and snare. So I'm on the SP-1200 because at that time, he didn't know how to use work the SP-1200. He l- later learned, but I did. And the engineer we had didn't know how to work the SP-1200, so it was just me. So I'm in there, I got the drums, and he says, I want the pattern to be just like the Beastie Boys. It's the new style. So it goes boom, tat, to doom, 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 tat, doom. That to do 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 that. So that's what I hit. Like do do that. So I put that down. So I'm like, okay, we need a bass line. You know, at this point, Dwick is out. You know, some other crazy records with bass. I was like, we need a crazy bass line. And Chris is like, I got this reggae bass line I want to put. And I'm like, oh, oh, no. always, oh, always, yeah, man. Come on, reggae. Like you, you do regular time. We need like a funk bass line. He's like, no, I got this bass line, and this is what I want. And he, he pulled out the ray and we I sampled do 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 and I put it to the drums and I'm listening to it do it I'm like oh this is trash this is garbage I'm out of here I stormed out the studio and left never heard the finished product so like two months later I'm in the club and I can't remember if it was either DJ SNS or if it was Mr C one of those two guys. Comes up to me and goes, yo, I'm DJing tonight. That new BDP record, Black Cop, is crazy. So I'm like, really? I said, oh, Chris must have did something else on another day. You know, it must have been something else. He says, I'm going to play it when I get on. So I'm like, okay, cool. He gets on and I'm hearing the same beat. Doom, tap, da, 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 da. I'm like, but now I'm listening to him like, hold up. This, this, this might be, you know, <laughs> this might sound all right. And then... I hear the lyrics. I had never heard the lyrics to the beat. So when I heard Black Cop, Black Cop, Black Cop, Black Cop, the way he's riding the beat, I'm like, oh, okay, this is dope. So I'm like, yeah, I think, you know, I, I at least co-produced a dope KRS record. So then when the credits came out, it was like, you know, produced by the guy, Pal Joey, who did the Pal original. Joey. Shout out to Pal Joey. He did Love's Gonna Get You. And and he did uh that that club record hot music hot hot music. If I played it for you, you would know it's like a club staple. He mm-hmm. also did Love's Gonna Get You. He also did this the original Black Cop. So when they turned in the credits, they, the credits had already been turned in before we even worked on the record. Mm-hmm. So when the record comes out, I see produced by Pal Joey, and I'm like, yo, you know, I finally get like you know I get a hot one, and my name is not even on it. So I'm like, ah, oh. then Mad Lion jumps on the same beat mm-hmm. and does shoot to kill every day. Then that blows. I'm like, yo, but you know, it's just one of those things, you know. And then it get then they then they took it and put it on Return of the Boom Bat album. And it gets more love. I'm like, ah oh, man, this is this. But you know, it is what it is. But yeah, Black Cops was a is a sore spot for me. But yeah, right. don't it's, a, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy don't too because when it when it ends up on Return of the Boom Bap, I mean, that's like that's premiere at his apex. Like that's apex yes. DJ premiere. So like yes. this record that you and your brother like fought over and and made a joint is like I mean it's it's right there with all of the the like classically DJ premiere produced so, like all of the stuff on that you you could argue one could make the argument that beat wise production wise that's the strongest KRS record 
I would, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm loving that. Thank you. I mean, we argued down, you don't understand an hour and a half back and forth with me trying to convince him to change this beat and him telling me no. An hour and a half straight. And then he changed it just like that. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. It's just, it's just, but that, me and him are always arguing about I, who's dope, who's whack. It's just a million of these arguments. You know, he 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 never likes anything. I always like I'm always coming to him like, yo, listen to this new thing. Oh, that's whack. And he'll come to me with something and I'm like, oh, that's whack. And we just go back and forth. I mean, I have a I have a million of those stories too. I mean. Man, I I, I wanna before we and again, man, you're being so generous with your time and no, your wisdom you. and your it. stories. You. And um so one of the things that I didn't know, I knew that you sh- showed up in the video for Just a Friend. But I didn't know that you almost died that day. And maybe that'd be a good story that people should really go get the book to to learn more about. But Biz is one of these people. And again, you just have to say rest in peace so many times in this in this book and and you know, so many amazing. But it really feels to me, and I, I only met Biz in passing, but mm-hmm. it really seems like he was the embodiment of the culture. When you talk yes. about him, like on the MC side, almost what like a red alert is. On the DJ side, like Biz really mm-hmm. seems to be that. Like when you talk about the fact, I've heard so many stories, like I'm, I'm, I'm close with Kane and Kane talks about Biz coming to his high school and, and uh, you know, and being at the mall. And like, so mm-hmm. your experience of, of talking, meeting Biz on tour and him saying, what, wait, what, what college do you go to? Yeah, I'll just come over there and pick you up. And like, he just shows up at, at, at the college. Yeah. I mean, so many people, so many of the Rock most him. important people. Mm. He used to pick Rakim up at the high school. when mm. he. I think Rakim was Kid Flash at the time. Mm-hmm. He's biz used to come pick him up and take him places to rhyme. All the way out in Long Island. He came all the way yeah. out to Jersey to yes. get you. Yes. Yes. He used to pick up Redman. Him and Redman used to hang out. Like, biz is just that type of guy, man. He's a connection to a lot of MCs people don't even know. You know, it's deep that like Dapper Dan, like we think about Dapper Dan as just we do about being a guy that just mm-hmm. made crazy clothes and he makes dope clothes and wild clothes mm-hmm. and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But to read his his memoir is like, man, this is a, a extremely highly intelligent, very socially black power conscious man. Mm-hmm. He learned how to tailor on in high school going to Africa. And then like most of his tailors are from Senegal and like his whole story is amazing. But he says mm-hmm. that of all the people, first of all, he mentioned in that book, he's like, KRS still owes me money, by the way. Oh, word. And I, I wonder if it's for um, the 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 jacket hat that he wore in the My Philosophy video. It did could Dapper, be. Did Dan make that? Da- Dapper Dan made that. He made. And did Chris the, give you that made, hat? He gave you one of yes. those hats. That's Chris the hat that gave you, me. Do you still have ha- that hat? Yes, I do. Oh, my God. I still have the hat from the crew. The, that same Hat is from the cover of By All Means Necessary, and he wore it in the video. He gave me that hat, and I used to wear that hat all the time. I still have that hat. It's beat up, but I still got it. And one day I I may give it to the Hip Hop Museum or something. Who knows? It's got to be in there or the hall, or the rock, rock and Roll Hall of Fame or something. Yeah, that would be dope. I still have the hat from that cover. Yes, I do. Man, did you see when they did the battle and Swiss Beats had that remade? I saw Swiss Beats that day. I was uh-huh. at the verses and I was like, because we were trying to figure out what video was that from? And I'm going, what video? And it was from Self Destruction when it, with the stars. Oh, okay. All right. I got it. it I got it mixed from, up. Because there's a different one I where thought. he's leaning on the Jeep and Fab Five Freddy did the right. video. At, okay. Right. That's my friend. No, the one that, that uh, Swiss Beats has on is from, is from Self Destruction when they pointed the camera. He pointed the camera. He had that one on. I think Dapper Dan did all of He did, first of all, he did everybody's suit. Every album cover, uh, Eric B. and Rakim, you know, he was doing everything. So shout out to Dapper Dan. I never met the guy, but um, man, he his, did a his, lot uh, of dope stuff. His book is amazing, man. I've, I've, uh, yeah, I've been through that book many times. But one of the things he says, like all these people, all these like fascinating people that he knew, he said the guy that he loved most that would come around and just sit the two of them out in front of his storefront in Harlem until seven in the morning. He said Biz would come and he said Biz could talk about any subject Anything. and that he was smart and hilarious and loving and he knew everybody and he was a real. So, I mean, it seems that Biz was really like the embodiment of hip hop in a, in a person. I, w- I wasn't close with him. 
I just want to give you space to just share with us anything about what it was like to be friends with Bismarcky. I mean, and we, you know, people don't know we were good. We were really good friends and we hung out a lot. And um, like you said, just generous and the funniest person I've ever met in my entire life. I can hand, I can say with confidence that just naturally the funniest person I have ever met. And um, he knew everybody. He would give you records. He, he also had, he was like an encyclopedia. He remembers every phone number that you ever tell him. He never writes phone numbers down. He knows every phone number, every sample, any break beat or sample, Biz could tell you the record. He could tell you what's on the cover of the record. And that's the one that had the elephant and the guy it was yellow with the pink in it. Like he'll tell you any record cover and any phone number that you want. Biz knows. Like he knows my number from like 20 years ago that I forgot. He'd be like, remember when you used to have the 201? So I was like, I'm like no, I don't remember that, Biz. But yeah, he remembers numbers like that. Funny guy. Just love down to earth. Never in a bad mood. You know, you never see Biz and he doesn't speak. Just a great man and a great friend. And I miss him dearly. Um, I had spoke to him right before he got sick. And, you know, we were talking. And the next thing I know, he was in the hospital. It's like, yo, you know what I mean? And we have so many adventures. You know, I, 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 I'd have to, like, write a, a side book just the amount of times me and Biz hung out. You know what I mean? Even the day of Just a Friend video, I had happened to be hanging with Biz the night before. And he's like, hey, why don't you stay in the morning? I'm shooting my video to my new one. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, cool. So the clothes I had on in the video just happened to be what I was wearing the day before, just hanging out with Biz. It was just that, you know, that spontaneous. Great man. I miss you, Biz. I love you. Shout to his family. Shout to Cool V. Um, till we meet again. Thank you for that. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. And it's a completely unsolicited suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like maybe it was Charlie Ahern or like one of those people that really like documented hip hop culture early on. Did a book called Yes, Yes, Y'all. It's like an oral history of early hip hop. Mm -hmm. And so he got everybody in the room and just allowed people to, to talk and he recorded it, transcribed it, all of that. Mm -hmm. Now that we've seen what you can do on the literary side, somebody's gotta, somebody's gotta put together uh, a book really documenting and paying tribute to biz. Yes. And now that we've seen, now that we've seen what you can do, you know, and, and somebody, somebody would give you money to do that. You know what I mean? And somebody would, 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 you know, but to whether it's an oral thing where you get all the people together that he knew mm -hmm. and that were part of his life, and you know all of these stories that you're talking about, but but somebody that that knows him, appreciates him, loves him, has the ability to to think in that kind of global way about preserving that, somebody should should take that over, and um, it's, it would Absolutely. be a huge would, task to I do, but uh, but it's. I would love it would be my honor to do something like that for biz because um you know people don't even really know they just know the songs you know people don't even know i saw on vh1 one time they had biz down as a one-hit wonder and they had just a friend and it was like biz Markie had like one song and i'm like you people don't even first of all you don't even know the culture to even that's like you know, just sounds ridiculous. And then, you know, people don't even know this man. What a, what a, what a great man. Like, you know, it's very rare when you meet a person who no one has something bad to say about. Like, mm -hmm. everyone who knows Biz, you just put, he puts a smile on your face. You know what I mean? And, you know, I, I'm, I was blessed to call him a friend and I would love to do something like that. You know, if, if, if it, if it comes to pass, that would be dope. Yeah, man. I really feel like we should we should maybe like holler at some of the some of the like publishers that do stuff right. like that. Yeah, you know what I mean. Because now I mean it's proven. Now it's proven like what you can do on the on the literary side. You know what I mean. Oh, thank you, thank you so much for that, man. Is there anything that, um, in terms of your personal work, um, things that you still? I mean, you've done so much. And if you never gave anything else to the culture, man, you would all forever be one of our absolute treasures. And I'm not just saying that because you're connected to your brother, but you, mm -hmm. what would you, what, what do you still have as a goal that you would like to do that maybe KRS will like force you to do tomorrow morning? 
I know, right? Um, I know that's funny. Oh, uh, because he really forced me into just about everything I've done. <laughs> that's so, so hilarious. I wouldn't be a DJ without him. I wouldn't produce without him. I wouldn't even be in a business without him. Like I owe him everything as far as business. Um, well, I have a lot of stories that I want to tell. You know, I, I you know, because I I rode shotgun with KRS for a lot of things, and I've seen a lot of stuff. And, you know, but when you're the guy next to the guy, you're almost invisible. Mm. So, you know, a lot of times I was right there when things happen, amazing things that people don't even know because they they were so focused on Chris, they can't even see me like I'm invisible. But I want to tell people a lot of the firsthand stuff that I saw, like just like in a book, like I was right there, like, you know, when... uh like Melly Mel and KRS battle the Latin Quarter. Like I was right front row. Like I I saw a lot of things like that. And I'd like to tell more of the stories that I saw. And I want to get back more into my production again. Cause I, you know, the past few years I've been working on a book. So I just been focusing on that. But now that the book is done and out, you know, I want to promote, it, but I also want to get back into the, you know, doing some more music. So it's music and I want to tell some more stories. That's where I'm at right now. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, this this one that you told, like I said, is just such a gift to us all, man. Everybody that knows and cares about this culture and also for generations to come. Like this is the type of thing that really needs to be documented and, you know, for people to just have access to the human story behind this great man. And, you know, yeah. and so many times that people are talking to you and I, I'm, I, I did a lot in, in, in this conversation, but mm -hmm. so many of the times we're talking to you, we're, we're talking about your brother, but absolutely, you know, and rightfully so, because yes. it's, it's an extremely important role, you know, that, that when we have these, I mean, he's, he's as big as we get, you right. know, like other people came along based on what he created and may got maybe got bigger notoriety wise. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, Jay-Z is more famous than, but there's a reason Jay-Z has a KRS impression, impersonation. There's a reason right. for that. Right. You know? um, right. And so for, in terms of like the people that know and love this culture, like he's as big as it, as it gets. And so, you know, for, for us to have an opportunity for someone that, and I, I, Forgive me, I don't know, I'm not close to the situation, but it just really seems like maybe nobody on earth knows him and loves him the way that you do. And you're able to tell this story in such a in such a, a loving way, in such an honest way. And Thank you. there's really not another person on earth that can do that. You know, so it's like, you know, what if, what if somebody you had the the gospels weren't written by Jesus, they were written by his companions. Right, right. You know what I mean? The hadith mm -hmm. weren't written by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were written by his companions. Right. You know, so it's like we we need the the community and the family around great people for us to even be able to contextualize right. them to right. fully appreciate because as much as I memorize every word he said, I I I could not fully uh comprehend and grasp like where this guy really came from. And as like a, you know, as an albino kid that grew up getting bullied and and all of this stuff, it's like, oh, this makes total sense. Why I right. could listen to this music and and like hear this commanding man that wasn't just commanding because he was big and loud and smart, but mm -hmm. it's like, no, we're here talking about virtue. We're here right. talking about knowledge and love and no. you know what I'm saying? So man, what 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 both of you men have have uh have given us all, man, we we are deeply indebted to you and we appreciate you and we love you. And man, we're forever at your service, man. Please consider me a little brother and a servant if there's Absolutely. anything I can ever do. Thank you for having me um, on your platform. I enjoyed every minute of this conversation. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Um, I like to talk, obviously, and, uh, you know, and I, I have a lot I want to get out and you're helping me to document. So thank you so much. Just a joy to, to connect with you, man. Lo loved you for a long time, respected you a long time. Your voice is Thank part you. of who I am. Thank you so much. And you're very knowledgeable. Of course, that's why I say, you know, I would love to be on your show because I know you're very knowledgeable and, and a historian. And, you know, you know, sometimes most of the interviews, you know, you do, people just say, like, yeah, you know, they talk a couple things, yeah, yeah, and then they're out. But, you know, you, you know BDP, you know, you, you read the book. It's just dope. I, I'm just happy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back at you, man.
Special thanks and much love to DJ Kenny Parker. We, we're we very, very grateful for his generosity just in sharing so much, man. You know, this I always say that these are people that I talk to, that most of them are my friends and people that I consider to be, you know, really dear companions. And I talk also about the fact that whenever I feel really connected to somebody, it just seems that the divine brings me together with them and we really connect on a on a heart level. And this is just one of those conversations that I'm like, okay, me and this guy are about to be friends probably forever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just really beautiful. Reading his book is such a beautiful thing. You got to check out My Brother's Name is Kenny. Uh, it just came out recently. This is a must-have for people that are lovers of this culture and really care about it and want to understand the human beings that just unearth these treasures and unleash them upon the world. The people who have shaped the culture, that have shaped the landscape of truth-telling and activism. You know, uh, It's just a really, really beautiful thing. So much love to DJ Kenny Parker. Go and check out that book. Special thanks to, uh, to BetterHelp and to Zakat Foundation and to Mystic Man. Always, we give special shouts out to Amna Mirza and Mansour Panawala and to Last Word and Darian Washington and Aida Rashid and Amir Rahman and to all the people that just really help this podcast be what it is. Not everybody's got a, a title, but um, there, you know, every every effort is a communal effort, is a group effort. I want to give a special shout out to to Reggie Olse. We mentioned the Combat Jack show is the greatest hip hop podcast that there is that there's ever been. Go check out that D-Nice episode. I want to give a shout out to Open Mike Eagle and, and what had happened was in the Secret Skin podcast, Mike is one of the people that really inspires me. Uh, give a special shout out to Talib Kweli, who like as a as a person that really does these, these tremendous uh, documents about the life and career of a person. I mean, nobody does it like him. So special shout out to my friend, Talib Kweli. Uh, Traveler's Podcast is produced by Brendan BK1 Kelly, and it's a production of Traveler's Media. We love you. We appreciate you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.